Call the meeting to order, please. Ms. Haley, if we could start with the roll call. Trustee Sussman. Here. Trustee Pollock. Here. Trustee Valerie. Here. Trustee Pollock. Here. Trustee Foley. Here. President Self. Here. Attorney Marks. Here. Village Manager Solera. Here. Also present, Village Clerk Kathy Hayes. So we have a quorum. Welcome to everyone in attendance tonight. Uh, please remember that if you'd like to speak to the board about any topic during our meeting, feel free to do so. I just ask that you be recognized by the chair and that you make your comments from, uh, from the podium so that everyone at home can, can hear you. And with that, I'd ask you to please join us at the pledge. First up this evening uh, are presentations and public comment. Uh, we do have a report by our ch uh, police chief, uh, Tom Weitzel. So, Chief. Mr. President and trustees, I'm just going to update you on a few reports that you've probably received in your packets over the last week. I'm going to start it with the racial profiling, which is commonly referred to. It's actually a traffic stop statistical study because it's required by state statute that it be posted on our website and that uh, uh, it be briefed at the board level. So I've done that every year. It is already on our website for our residents to see. And it's pretty standard. Uh, our benchmark in our court district, that's how they measure us. They use the minority populations for the court district you attend is 59.6%. What that means is our police department to have a good number, our minority violators should not exceed 59.6% according to the, the IDOT stats. We did not. Our number is 50.16 for minority violators and Caucasian is 49.84. I'm not a real big proponent of this statute because as you can see, it has nothing to do with the racial profiling. I re we, like for example, Riverside reported 2,496 traffic stops. We had a lot more than that because the racial profiling statute does not require that you do a sheet, a racial profiling sheet on every traffic stop you make. Only certain traffic stops apply. So to me, the numbers are very um, suspect. But it is a state statute. Um, there currently is no sunset provision. This state statute will continue to go on, and I believe, forever. We are presently being funded by an IDOT grant we received when the program started. We put in for a grant instead of higher personnel. We have a scanner machine. The officers fill out these what are called bubble sheets in the squad car. They're turned into a, their sergeants and they're scanned into a machine and they're sent every month in a data package to the Illinois Department of Transportation who then sends it to Northwestern University to do the study. Um, so we I also had no complaints from residents or any motorists this year that they felt at any time they were being profiled by one of my officers um, and our I added the um, Gender based that is not required by statute, but the tickets do track that so I included that just as another bit of information So um, I have submitted my report to the governor's office uh, July 1st as required and I just wanted to brief you if there's any questions I could answer them. Trustee. Okay, my next report is the six month crime stats. Um, I, it, now these ended June 30th, so it, obviously it doesn't take into the activity, activity we've had lately, but overall the crime would have been up 4.2% at six to six month mark compared to 2012 six month. I don't consider that very substantial because that only comes out to three more reportable crimes. Our actual uh, physical arrests we made so far is down 300 or 3.6%. We made 211 arrests in the first six months of 2013. That includes juvenile arrests. And then I included some other stats just um, for your review. Calls for service are down 9.6. Those are actually officers responding to somebody's call for assistance, no matter what that be. The administrative phone calls that came into the 911 center dropped by 13%, and our 911 calls are down over 24% at the six-month mark. 
Traffic tickets are down 30.9%. That's substantial, but we've also been down two officers. So those we've had less officers available on free time to do specific traffic enforcement. I do believe that that will um, increase as these new officers become uh, fully trained and out on their own in the patrol cars and not still being trained. Uh, parking tickets were up 10% and DRI arrests were down 23%. Um, and that is you know, usually a midnight function, although we do see some on days and four to twelves. And the midnight shift has been understaffed the entire year because the officers that retired or left were out of that shift. And now the newest officer, Isaac Hamilton, will probably go to midnight to replace him when he's completely trained. So I included the administrative tow fee and the fines and forfeitures. The administrative tow fees are down 17%. That's directly related to physical arrests. If we're not making arrests where individuals are driving cars, we're not, we don't, there's no need for us to tow those cars, and the administrative tow fee is not assessed. And remember, we don't assess the tow fee on victims. So if your car is stolen and we recover it, we don't charge you. If you're a victim in an auto accident, you are not billed by the village for the administrative tow fee. It's only for individuals that are arrested under a criminal statute. The fines and forfeitures are actually up. Even though citations are down, it's up almost 3%. That's our cut from the court system, which I can tell you is very low. Out of a $125 speeding ticket, the village is lucky to see $17 out of that when everybody takes their cut. And sometimes it's much lower than that, as low as $8. So um, it's always been a complaint of mine when the officers are the ones actually doing the work and the village is getting very little of the, um, really the, the product of the enforcement that they do because the fine is assessed to as a traffic enforcement tool. But that's not gonna go away. Um, it seems every year the state adds another chunk. Some other organization takes money out of the traffic fines. So I have not, this report um, will be posted on the website hopefully tomorrow. Um, if there's any questions I could answer about the six month report, it probably will go up a little bit with the rash of burglaries I'll speak about and the thefts, but at the six month um, point, it was relatively steady. Is that all? Uh, um, all fines that the, the state takes, from, like parking tickets, does that no. get No, parking tickets, in the, village? the majority of that money will come to the village. And the compliance tickets, those are state tickets, the ones we have to issue on state roadways or certain state violations. But for example, a $125 ticket in the Maybrook Courthouse, you know, $25 of that goes to emergency room hospitals to treat uh, medical patients and automobile accidents. I mean, everybody gets a cut. Of, there's, the clerk's office gets $30 for processing the ticket. The court system gets $25 for the judges to be there. The police department in the village, in every municipality in Cook County, is at the bottom. Whatever's left over is the fine that we get. So it literally can go between $8 and $15 per ticket. And that would be a standard. Many towns are trying to get away from that by going to local ordinances, but if you're, you know, um, that you can't do that on some state statutes. The Secretary of State sued two uh, suburban communities for putting speeding tickets and other violations on a local ordinance, and they won. And the municipalities had to pay back the state, and they are no longer allowed to put those specific charges under local ordinance. Anything else? Thank you. And that's my final report. I just wanted to update you on that. The, well, burglar arrest we made. Um, obviously, that it was the single largest clearance we've had in my 28 years here, and I couldn't find one in our records that was more than that. Um, these two individuals had prior criminal histories. Um, they worked the village exclusively at night, these two individuals. They did not know each other. Um, and they were arrested on the same night, which is extremely unusual. Um, one individual was a teenager, 18, 19 year old from Maywood, and the other one was a career criminal. Uh, Milo Simmons, I had arrested myself in the 1990s for committing residential burglaries on Fairbanks Road, and when I saw him in our lockup, he remembered me, so that was nice. <laughs> uh, he's only been out of prison like 14 years in his entire life, and I think he's 41 years old, he told me. These are all, dri he was driven by a drug habit, the individual from Maywood was driven by getting money. I had calls from residents who did not like a quote I made that said that they thought I said that Riverside was easy pickings. What I said was that the detective, 
he, they always try to interview the suspect to find out why they picked your house or why they picked your garage. And in each case, they said, because they didn't have to break in, in most cases. All they had to do was try the doors. And in some cases, the garage doors were left open at night. They didn't even have to force in. They could just walk in and take your lawnmowers and your bicycles and whatever they want. So they're going to keep coming back until they get caught because it's extremely, in their mind, easy. The Milo Hamilton said he came to Riverside because he got better equipment from our residents. And he would get more money when he either sold them on the street or pawned them. They're usually very forthcoming when they get arrested because they've done this before. And sure enough, when we check the pawn sheets, Mr. Ham Mr. Simmons is on there all the time pawning stuff. So just this past week, we uh, submitted over 14 pieces of evidence from other burglaries, fingerprints against both Mr. Ham uh, Mr. Uh, Simmons and um, Mr. Tomer to the Illinois State Police Crime Lab, hoping that we can clear other burglaries that they weren't able to be charged. So I encourage residents to close your garage door, lock your doors, turn your lights on, because by their own admissions, if they, the uh, individual from Maywood, if your car door was locked, he went to the next house. He said that, as simple as that. He didn't want to break, he didn't want to make noise if he couldn't. He'd just go door to door to door to door to door, all the way down the driveways. So I think that's a really good piece of information that you know, all you have to do is maybe lock your doors and you could avoid being a, a victim of a theft or a burglary. So if anybody has any questions, the officers worked very hard on that case all weekend and um, I, I do think you'll see more indictments as the physical evidence comes back on some of these unsolved cases that we have. Anything from the trustees? Great job, thank you. Yes, very, thank you. very nice job. Thank you to you and your, and your Police officers. Thank you. And you know, we a few years ago we had uh, the Safe Environment Commission did a a program where they brought in a number of of convicted burglars, and every single one of them said exactly the same thing that you just said, Chief. It's a crime of opportunity. If you make it hard on them, they go to the next house. So let's make it hard on them. Okay. Next up is public comment, Mr. Galagos. Alex Gallios, 3234 South Harlem. <clears throat> Good evening, Mr. President, trustees, those in attendance, and to those watching at home. Sir, I come before you, the Village Board, on behalf of the Chamber of Commerce. It is my pleasure to inform the public of the upcoming Chamber event. Next Thursday, the Chamber will be hosting its third cruise night of the season. It will take place here on Burlington from 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. All residents are encouraged to attend. Grumpy's, Tap Room, Molly's, and Empanadas will all be open that night, as well as Choo Choo, and they will have their taco tent up again. <clears throat> Please uh, patronize local businesses. Wednesday, August 28th, is Riverside Day, a time modern tradition dating back to the 1950s. Each year, the Chamber and the Lions Club select a person of the year and honor them for their contributions to our community. This year, Ruth Friark is being honored. On behalf of the Chamber and the Lions Club, all residents are welcome to attend her dinner at the Riverside Golf Club. Tickets are 43 per person and are available at Riverside Bank, Arcade Jewelers, the Library, and the Art Center. Tickets are available until August 18th. They will not be sold thereafter or at the door. Cocktails are at 6 p.m., dinner is at 7 o'clock. Uh, it's a cash bar and dress is semi-formal. And sir, that's all I have for today. Thank you much. Thank you, sir. Alex. Yes. Um, what when you uh, the person of the year? You make the checks out to the Lions Club or the Riverside Chamber of Commerce or Riverside Lions Club. Riverside Lions Club. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Mr. Butter. Good evening, I'm Jerry Buttermer. I live on Scottswood in Riverside. And uh, I'm, I'm here to report back on paths. In July, the board discussed paths and they discussed economic development and some very exciting things for the future, bringing people to the river, increasing the recreational uses of the river and so on. I referred at that time to the concept of a missing link to connect paths along the banks of the Displains. Tonight I return with some images and a low cost plan to make that connection. 
It shows how we can safely travel through great landscape, past magnificent architecture, and gain priceless views. Uh, it'll take two minutes. I'll hand out the copy of the report and I'll answer any questions. You can see that we had landscape changes and river changes and they created opportunity. An opportunity to renew the relationship with Swan Pond, the banks, the bridges, and so on. There were improvements on both sides of the river. And the, obviously the two bridges connect them. What I referred to as the missing link. And it would complete a unique path. That missing link is basically about 400 feet behind the municipal buildings. There it is with a red line drawn in for a proposed path. And it completes a one mile loop. Safety is always a concern I have with pedestrians and with any sports. And there are 10 points of conflict in front. There are none behind the buildings. It shows our landscape, our great architecture. And there's characteristics of that strip. It's elevated with great views. It's nine feet wide. And I would propose that it doesn't take much to make it usable. It's a low cost effort with, I think, what could be a very priceless result. Here's a copy of the plan that I proposed, and here's a copy of the slides that were presented. Thank you, Jerry. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have now, or I'd be happy to return at, at your convenience. Does anybody have anything like they'd like to ask Mr. Butterman? I have a question, yeah. I, what, are you asking anything of us right now? Well, I'm asking, I'm not asking for your money. I'm not, ask, I'm not trying to take anything out of your budget. I'm basically asking for your blessing and your permission to proceed. I've recruited volunteers. Uh, the list is included in that plan. It's a, it's a pretty prestigious group, including Jim Louthan, a landscape architect and active civic leader. Uh, Tom Lupfer, who uh, owns a landscape company. Tom is also the head of our uh, Economic Development Commission. We sat next to each other at that meeting and we struck up a conversation. He was asking, could we, you know, wh how else could this be used? Can this be used to draw good people into town that will patronize our businesses? That, that's up to the long range planning with, that the village is doing. My, my offer is to clear the path. What, what do you need from the village, other than, uh, other than to say, Jerry, go, go cut? Well, we, you know, I'd like to tell you we're going to do it very economically, and we are, but we do need the village's help in a couple of areas. First off, permission. Secondly, you guys all have a duty to protect everybody, so we should constantly check in with whoever is assigned. There is debris that need to be removed. I think, and that this would be worked out with village manager Scalera or public works director Bailey, but I would, my guess is that we do a lot of the work on the weekends and that we could use a chipper and a truck on Monday morning. I, th I think we could probably avoid overtime for staff, but if they were there on Monday morning and throw things in a chipper and haul it away, then it would be in the area of your parking. Uh, I think we'd have our our safety issues approved by Ed and village manager Scalera. Right now that area is protected by signs that say basically keep out. I would recommend that we close the east and the west end so that when we're not working, no one's in there. Uh, <clears throat> that's about it. Do you have permission, Jerry, from the township to connect this path to the bridge? The, well, the, the, the swinging bridge belongs to the township. The, you're, you're right, the township does control the bridge. Uh, township Supervisor Tusher was cooperative last year okay. in working with RB High School on a race that they promoted across that bridge. Okay. So there is no physical, I'm not anticipating any type of physical connection or any construction or any alteration whatsoever to that bridge. It'd be similar to, if I wanted to walk what becomes a one mile loop, I would step on the bridge, cross the other side, go down the path, come back. To right, the but you, you need to bring the path up to the, the foot of the bridge. Um, 
behind the building, behind the youth center, um, and where that parking lot is, you're going to have to bring the path up to make it, you know, so that one could walk onto the bridge <clears throat> or continue the path under the bridge and well, up right, the bank. Right, right now, if you trudge through there you were with your machete, you'd come down the hill and you'd step over the parking lot curb, walk 10 feet, step up the next parking lot curb, walk down a four foot hill and step onto the bridge. I'm not proposing altering that. I think long range, if you guys have a vision of a river walk or some other more aesthetically pleasing venture, those things should be considered. Trustee Pollock. Yes, I would, uh, I, first of all, I very much appreciate the, uh, the recommendation, the suggestion. I think it seems like a no brainer on the surface at least, but I would ask that, um, or suggest that we ask the village manager to look into this, provide uh, a report to us about the feasibility, where we can help uh, with or without financial assistance, have topography issues like that, and bring this back on the agenda at a future date as soon as possible for us to consider moving forward with something like this. I mean, I have no idea if this is feasible, but it sounds like a great it, it, idea. Well, <laughs> and, and having, having, walked, having walked this parcel with Mr. Buttermer, it is feasible, albeit uh, to the river side of this path, there is a embankment or a wall, if you will, a seawall, uh, for lack of better words, that is probably about a foot thick, but all of about 10, 10 feet tall in some areas. So there would have to be some fencing that would have to go along that to prevent one from falling off of that wall into the riverbank area. So, you know, this is going to have to be part of the plan and the fencing and you know what's the fencing going to look like and and so forth but i i, I agree with with doug this, this is some of this low hanging fruit that we talked about this is these are some of these ideas that we can implement and uh i think harken off of the c map about taking advantage of the river and seeing the river um, and if we are able to clear up this venue uh, it'll be a lot more uh, i think a lot more pretty uh, to host the farmers market in that parking lot if all those trees are cleared out and one could be shopping back there and see the river um, i think it'd be nice and and i'm not proposing to add what i'm basically recommending is to clear the runway i i think folks will be amazed when it's cleared enough that you can walk back there without coming out with poison ivy and in a safe environment all the way around, the people will be amazed at the views. and They're going to say things like, why didn't we do this before? Now, it, Trustee. Trustee Foley, I couldn't agree with you more, and Trustee Pollock, it will need a safety rail. It will need some type of fencing. My initial reaction is that it is so overgrown from the lower bank, not that I would ever pr propose anything aesthetically unpleasing in this town, but what you need for safety is going to be hidden by what's the foliage that's already there growing up from the, from the lower bank. So you could make the nine foot wide strip barren and you won't see it anywhere from standing on the strip. Trustee Sussman. Jerry, I also appreciate you doing this and your persistence in coming back after, after last year's race. Uh, I think that I would agree that um, the village manager and his staff should take a look at this. I think all of us have obviously a couple of concerns that have been articulated. I really think we should turn it over to the village staff to have them look at what absolutely needs to be done to make it a safe and accommodating path. And then I don't know, Peter, if it's possible, given all everything else that's going on, to get back to us at the next board meeting. I understand Jerry would like to start working on this really before school gets underway, because a lot of the volunteers will be most, you, no? most of the volunteers on that list are all adults from engineers to architects. Oh, well then heck, wait till September. What well, <laughs> you should have said yes, it's students, yeah. Right, right. No, I mean, I, I understand you'd like to do it sooner rather than later and get it done by bad weather. So, I mean, this was actually one of the items that, was, right. that we approved on, right. on our CMAP, the CMAP initiatives was to do the, exactly this study to try to find out what the condition is back there. And, and it seems to me it, there's a little bit of a chicken and egg problem going on here mm -hmm. because until we really get that area cleared out, 
it's going to really be kind of hard to, de to determine what kind of fencing or railing or something like that that we actually need. Now, was it was it your anticipation that that this uh, this, this railing or fencing would be donated in, or to the village or? Yes, and the next logical question is, well, who's going to give it to you? And how much does it cost? And what exactly is it going to look like? And my question, is, my answer is. Give me a target, and I'll tell you what the target will look like. If you give me permission, I'll go without doing anything. You know, once once we know we have a bona fide project, I'll raise the money. I'll get the fencing. This is a word I never thought I would use in <laughs> beautiful Riverside. But black chain link, if it's only 42 inches high, you look right through it. You won't see it. And that will give you all the structural fence that you need to be compliant. When you have a clean, run, clear runway and you say, boy, we're going to build a replica of the refectory dining room. We're going to have a veranda overlooking the river. We want stainless steel and glass. Throw the other one away. Becomes your construction fence. And actually, that's the other thing that I really like about this idea is, is you know, one of the things that we're going to have to look at down the road is what to do with the former youth center. And one of the things that's nice about this idea is it actually provides some access behind those buildings where our residents could actually get a, a sense of what's back there and the potential that is back there. So, uh, I mean, I, I think we have a consensus that, that, that we'll have uh, staff look at this, but I would encourage us to move on this as quickly as cool. possible. I, I'm, I'm thinking to myself, and I, I, I tend to run faster than I walk. Um, but you know, I look at it and go, "What's the what's what's? I mean, what, why why not just start shipping it away?" I mean, how can we see what the potential is until we get the stuff out of there? Again, it's the chicken and the egg. What what possible? I mean, what could staff come back to us and say that would derail this 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 this, this project that they don't have? Well, and and another way to look at it is, what is the worst case scenario? Exactly. How, how does it look today? I can't even screw that up. <laughs> I mean, if, if we go back and we get started and we discover an oil pipeline running through it, we stop. If we get started and wh whatever comes up that would say, back off, be cautious, close it down, L lock it down at both ends, and it's in fact safer than it is now. Well, people cut through regardless. So, right. You know, that's happening. Well, right now it's happening. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So we're not keeping people out by not cleaning it out. Cutting through behind the library. No one is is cutting yeah, right. behind, right. behind the garage. Right. You can't right. get through there. My only concern is that once you start hacking and then you do open the door to possible liability issues on the part of the village, and that if people access that area and something happens. I. I. If we're just talking about how long, Peter, for you to get back to us. I can, I, it won't take me that long. To so why clear. two weeks? I think we should be able to wait two weeks and deal with any kind of possible liability concern that Peter or his staff may have. I don't think that that should be an impediment. It's not going to snow Mr. Mars, September 1st. Do you have anything to add about the liability side of it? Uh, in terms of liability, you know, they, I was looking at this, uh, some of the materials handed out. They do propose uh, having a a waiver signed by the volunteer, the various volunteers. Um, I think we'd like to, you know, make sure that says what it needs to and get it in place. I know Peter has spoke with your insurance carrier and they want to come out and do sort of a walk around to, to get a sense of uh, what might be involved. Um, it, we're talking about people using the village chipper down there. Uh, and so I, I think those are things that should be no. considered. And the other thing I wanted to point out at is, is this is public comment tonight. It's not really on here as an agenda right. item. So it's fine for everyone to sort of reach a consensus and send everybody off to do these things. But uh, I, I, I would advise that we put it off uh, for two weeks and come back with a final decision. Then. So, Mr. Spreader, can you, can you get a, a draft of your proposed volunteer waiver? Uh, what so I would propose is what's off of the we could just website. Use the one. I think we could just use the one we okay. use for our normal volunteers. And can you can you get back to us in a couple weeks? So and we'll put this we'll put this on the agenda, perfect. the actual agenda for uh, for action in two weeks. And and we don't plan on having any of the volunteers use the chipper. They can be. I'm not letting you very very. <laughs> oh, chipper! <laughs> We'd have to count them and then count them when we're done. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Rose. Anyone else? Thank you, Jerry.
Ms. Mateo. Jill Mateo, 86 Northgate. I'll keep it brief. Last fall, my neighbors on Northgate and I submitted a petition with our signatures to the previous village board and to Representative Mike Zaleski. Um, 22 homes experienced frequent power outages and very long restoration times, and we needed help with ComEd. And as per Peter's suggestion, this is what we did. We got the petition and submitted it to the board and to our representative. I'm happy to say now that next month we're getting a new power line installed on 26th Street in the back of our homes. So I just wanted to say to Peter tonight, thank you very much for all your help, gathering data, arranging our meetings, and helping us get our hopefully power issues resolved. If nothing else, we'll be among the first to get our power restored, not the last. So we're happy to that. And thanks also to Representative Zaleski, who made a lot of phone calls to his ComEd representatives. And I was able to thank him personally today. He was on Northgate ringing doorbells, just checking in with residents to see what concerns they had. So thanks to him too. So thank you, Peter. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone else? Okay, moving on, we will go to the village president's report. Before I get to the official item, I just want to fill the board in on a few things that have been happening in the last couple of weeks. Mr. Scalair and I have been pretty busy. Uh, last week, we, uh, we hosted a meeting, a follow-up meeting with regard to the First Avenue improvements. And present at the, at the meeting, I was glad to see Mayor Hermanek from North Riverside uh, joined us along with Trustee Ryan from Brookfield. We also had representatives from Districts 208 and 96, and the senior officials and engineers from IDOT who are actually in charge of, of designing the project. They presented three alternatives to the various stakeholders at the meeting, two of which really became obvious quickly were non-starters. The, the first alternative, it, it keeps the existing roadway and then would add two turn lanes, a, a, a right turn lane from, on, from First Avenue onto Ridgewood going southbound, and then a right turn lane off Forest Avenue going northbound on First Avenue. So that one seemed to be very clean and easy to implement. The other two uh, alternatives that were put forward anticipated a, a median, a safety median of some kind, which, as the, the engineers explained to us, would actually involve basically moving the entire roadway. Uh, and it would move the entire roadway either significantly into Forest Preserve uh, property within the, the Riverside District the boundaries, or would also move it into the, into, more into the high school. So it was, it was pretty obvious to everyone there that, that, was, that those were non-starters. So there was unanimous uh, agreement that the, the first alternative, as they called it, Alternative A, should be, should be followed. And that will, that will entail very significant safety uh, enhancements to the intersection itself, uh, uh, new crosswalks, new painting for the crosswalks, timed signals for pedestrians, that kind of thing. And it will allow the project most significantly to continue on its pace. I mean, we've been very fortunate, and again, Representative Zaleski has been instrumental in this, to getting this moved to the front burner for, uh, on IDOT, for IDOT. So we don't want to lose that momentum. So we're going we're gonna to move forward with that. So that was a very successful meeting. Uh, IDOT also has installed a new historic business district sign for us on North Avenue that actually, on, I'm sorry, on, on First Avenue that actually directs people into our business district. So that was greatly appreciated as well. Uh, just today I got a note from Mr. Scalera that the Illinois Green Infrastructure Grant Program in their brochure now features our green parking lot that we were able to get built here because of their, because of their grant. So that was a very nice thing to see. Uh, we met last week also with staff from Senator Kirk's office, and we discussed the, the application for renovating the, the train station. Senator Kirk's office has agreed to provide a letter of support on our behalf with regard to that grant application. And we also spoke about the need for a revised FEMA formula with regard to getting assistance for local municipalities. The, the current formula used uh, by FEMA, Cook County is figured into the formula, and often what happens is, and this is re with regard to the record floods back in the spring, our damage is taken into account to a point where it will trigger FEMA assistance to local municipalities other than Cook County. But because of the 
population density of Cook County, we are rarely able to actually meet the threshold so that municipalities within Cook County can get assistance. For example, I think our, I think our bill was a little over $70,000 this year in terms of cost to the village. Uh, so staff agreed to take that back to Senator Kirk as well. Uh, I also met with Senator Sandoval uh, last week to talk about our economic development initiatives here in Riverside. He was, he was very supportive and he has agreed to support our grant application for the Burlington Street Streetscape grant that we're in the process of preparing now that is due on August 20th. And of course, he's also gonna continue trying to champion our efforts to get a grant for our train station roof. And lastly, uh, yesterday I attended the Metropolitan Mayor's Caucus quarterly meeting where the main focus there, as always with these local groups, is to try to protect local revenue uh, from the, the incessant de attempts by Springfield to get their hands on more of local money. So that is an ongoing battle as well. So that has been our busy week or so. So I appreciate all that. Yes. I don't know if it's when the appropriate time is, but uh, this issue of the IDOT improvements at Forest and First has come up a couple of times. Is it appropriate for me to comment on that? Please, please do. Um, I think that I know I don't have a say in it. It's an IDOT project. Mm -hmm. It's their project. They're going to do what they want to do. But I feel very strongly that adding right turn lanes uh, is a bad idea for pedestrians, for our high school students. Uh, you're in, increasing the crossing time by 20% by adding a fifth lane. And the purpose of right turn lanes is one thing, to move more traffic faster. That too is contrary to pedestrian safety. And as a father of a son who goes to RB and two other kids will go there in the future, I, that concerns me greatly. I, I really don't like the idea of adding turn lanes there. Um, I think it, it, it is just bad for pedestrian safety. So I just want to be on the record as saying that. I know I don't really have a whole lot of say in it, but, but that's been really bugging me and I wanted to get that out. So, so there it is. Any other comments? Just a comment to that, Doug. Um, if you're over there in the morning, the frustration with the drivers with not being able to turn right because of the pedestrians trying to cross and then they do really dangerous things because they want to really turn right so i'm thinking that it would ease it actually because then people can turn right and get out of there and won't be you won't have the the rage that you have right now with drivers um, it's crazy in the morning with people trying to turn right there who can't and they do really bad things trying to so, so is the proposal that the right turn lane only be when you cannot cross the street what happens right now is that you only have the right, you only have the one lane. Right. And so someone can't turn right because there are pedestrians. So that car sits there the whole time. So no cars get to go through the intersection. So then when, when the pedestrians are done and that car turns, then everyone tries to get through there. And so if you could get those cars out of there from the right turn lane, it would actually be safer, in my opinion, for pedestrians. And IDOT has been out there. I mean, they've had people on site doing traffic studies and pedestrian counts. And, and the, also that what figures into this significantly is the actual pedestrian countdown signals that they're, they're, they're proposing. So that will all be taken into account. Chief Wasso, did you, have, did you want to add anything with regard to what Trustee Pollitt brought up? I will agree with uh, Trustee Collins. It's, it's a disaster there during this school year, and that's probably me putting it mildly. We have an officer there every single day at drop off either our community service officer or a police officer unless we're so busy on other calls we can't handle it and even the officers get frustrated with the actions of the drivers to get through the intersection from what i saw when we attended the meeting their traffic engineering study uh, and their expert that were there were very convincing to me and it is the same type of intersection design that they've done numerous times in other locations, not necessarily by a high school, but a high volume traffic and pedestrian intersection. And I was impressed with what they, they displayed because if you go all the way back to two years when the process started, the turn lanes were never involved. If you remember, it was just gonna be restriping and maybe new traffic signals. The pedestrian countdown was never uh, considered until um, um, 
Representative uh, Zaleski got involved, there, the roadway markings, the turn lanes, and that's not because he got it done, it's because he got IDOT to get their engineers to actually come out to the scene. And you know, I've been here 28 years and I could tell you it really couldn't have happened any better than the day we visited the intersection and the traffic and children and mothers and mothers with babies and strollers I, it was like something out of a movie that it all happened that day because it was really bad when we stood out there on the corner and they got a really good look at what what the traffic volume is and I think that was probably about nine or ten o'clock in the morning so I, I am hopeful that um, it goes through but I, I do believe it'll cause a uh, an improvement and I do remember that we still will have the crossing guard there so I mean there are there, are, there is the crossing guard now as I've said before, a lot of high school students sometimes cross the other way because they don't want the guard to cross them. But the guard is there and will cross whoever is, uh, you know, is, is at the intersection. So. Well, I'm sorry. I'll, I'll just conclude by saying I, I, this just looks to me like another case of, of a transportation department whose mission is to move cars. And that moving of cars is overriding uh, pedestrian safety because a five lane roadway is much much more difficult to cross and much less safe than a four-lane roadway and there's that that's pretty you know that that's all i've got to say about it so it's already five lanes right because there's a left turn lane you're right five so we're talking about no i i that's just what i'm trying to get an understanding of so they would be actually taking adding the lane off of that corner, right where RB is? The, the right turn lane going southbound on First Avenue would require a right of way by District 208 in front of the school. But what do does, you know, that, do does you, that mean they're adding another lane? Is it gonna be yeah, six they're lanes? Yeah, they're widening, widening, widening it. Okay. Yeah. And, and the, with regard to Forest Avenue, uh, that turn lane, that actually exists within a current public right of way. So there wouldn't, there wouldn't be any right-of-way negotiations required with the village. That, that, was, that one's straightforward. The, the next step is going to be, IDOT is going to send their engineers out to actually stake out the, where the turn lane in front of uh, RB would actually be so that the, the RB school board and uh, Dr. Skinkus can see the actual layout of it. So that's really the next step in the process in terms of this is their phase one, their engineering their engineering portion, engineering design. And, and uh, to Doug's point, I'm just curious, there are, there are all these groups now that are advocates for alternatives to car and bus transportation, and IDOT does work with them, but do you know, have some of these um, organizations that look at furthering bicycles and pedestrian walks been involved with this? The, the other aspect of this is there is going to be a, a road safety audit which is, is conducted by the, the, the federal government. And this is really to really supplement or complement the, the studies that IDOT have, has already done with regard to their so safety analysis. So this is prior to doing the work? Yes, this is, all, this is all going on concurrently as part of the design process. So we will keep you apprised. Back to official business. Next up is a motion to reappoint and appoint uh, several members of the Riverside Cable Commission with regard to reappointments, uh, Mark Yerke, term to expire May 15, 2016. Stephen Wojcik, term to expire May 15, 2016. Donald Farnham, term to expire May 15, 2016. And also appointing Greg Gorsey for a one-year term as chairperson, his chairperson uh, term to expire May 15, 2014. And then a new appointment, uh, Eric Sundstrom, whose term would expire May 15 and 2015. So I'd ask for a motion and a second for the- Motion to approve. Second. second. Motion by Mr. Foley, second by Mr. Ballerine. Any discussion? Ms. Haley? Trustee Sussman. Aye. Trustee Pollock. Aye. Trustee Ballerine. Aye. Trustee Collins. Aye. Trustee Foley. Aye. Motion carries, and I thank all of these folks for agreeing to serve our community on the Cable Commission. President Sells. Um, yes. Has to do with cable. I, um, just to update everybody that uh, starting, I believe, the August 20th board meeting for District 96, uh, they will be televised by the Riverside Cable Commission. Um, District 96 has uh, agreed to the uh, to the to the tele televising. Um, it will come up about three or four days after the meeting, and it will be available on our channel as well as YouTube. So this is 
It's an exciting time for the Cable Commission. What date was that? When's the first one? I think the first one that is August 20th. August 20th. That's great. Excellent. Next up is approval of the consent agenda. But before we actually get to the consent agenda, there there are a few. Oh, I'm sorry. Did you want to say something, I, Mr. Scott? I did have a couple of updates <laughs> I wanted to share with you. Did you see how nice that he does that with his? You know, what you didn't see is him kicking me in. <laughs> um, I will be brief. I just wanted to provide an update to the community that the uh, CN railroad repairs to the crossing between Harlem and First Avenue on 26th Street should be completed this coming Sunday. Um, the railroad will then move over to the crossing located between Des Plaines and First Avenue on August 13th at 8 a.m. in which the crossing will be closed. Um, the railroad anticipates completion of the improvements to that crossing by August 15th. Um, village staff has been working, and, and by village staff I, I really mean Kathy Haley, um, along with our department heads, has been working with ABC Studios in regards to a shooting that will take place in Riverside this coming Saturday and next Friday for a new series um, titled Betrayal. The taping will create sporadic street closures in the Long Common and Delaplane area, um, and the ABC studio staff will be distributing a leaflet in the area, which I think they were doing today. Um, they have been in contact with a number of the residents in the immediate area there, and um, much to everyone's surprise, I'm not surprised, but I think they were surprised, a number of the residents offered up their own driveways um, to be used uh, in any way that they want for the uh, shooting. So I thank all of the residents for their patience. And finally, I wanted to let everyone know that ComEd has informed the village that they plan to begin installation of the smart meter program here in Riverside in September. ComEd is aiming for a November completion date and will be sending out letters in the coming month to uh, all residents and customers regarding the program, as well as they will be distributing flyers on the train platform um, prior to the program kickoff. And that is all I have. So when's the casting call for cameos for them? <laughs> Joey, you gonna do it? Are we talking about Bird? Yeah, we're talking about Bird. <laughs> Today, Trustee Sussman and I and, and Bob Carraher were over on Bird, and the amount of people, we were there, what, 10 minutes? Yeah. I would say 50, if I'm exaggerating. No. 50 cars turned off a long common onto Bird, went down to the end, even though it says dead end, turned around, came back down Bird, and I mean, by this time, most of them were frustrated. Mm -hmm. One almost got in an accident on the long common. Um, and or they believed that if you, you could get back out to Harlem over the tracks by turning uh, right, even if they saw the, I can't, where, I can't see the woman who lives on Bird, but even if they saw the sign that said no exit. They still go. They still went there, or if they didn't, they turn right, but you can't get over the tracks that way. Is there? Uh, something that the Public Works Department can put, uh, clo oh, yeah, road there you closed, are. <laughs> um, you know, uh, local traffic only, no access over the railroad tracks. Yeah, I think it's no out. access well, I can, to. I can check and see what kind of signs that we have. Um, but the project is, go the, the crossing is going to be open Sunday morning. Uh, today was, I, I was amazed on how right. much traffic. I, and I, all I, of a sudden it was fine and then just like that it I can check. Turned. Yeah. Okay. I think that was duly noted by the chief. I had several resident complaints and emails. <laughs> I've signed an officer over there. Um, we've issued tickets, we put out the that speed calming device up on Northgate. And just this past last two days, we issued six citations to overweight trucks that have made it into the center of town because they can't get around down there, even though it's posted. So I have, I have as much as I can, but um, that, what Trustee Ballerine said is, is accurate. Actually, during rush hour, it's worse. They don't, they, they actually come all the way up to Long Common and they just either split to Riverside Drive or they come down Long Common. So I've had an officer at uh, Long Common at Selborne between 4 and 6 and 6.30 unless they get called to another location. So it's most of it's just to give information. Yeah. And it, they're frustrated. You they can are. look on their faces. They're, they're, they, 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 they've been sitting on Harlem for a long time mm -hmm. right. and they're getting frustrated. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee. 
Thank you, Jean. Thank you, Joe. So before we get to the consent agenda, there, there are a couple items on here with regard to special event applications. And I see Ms. Maloney in the audience. Would you like to just tell us a little bit about this before we actually get to the consent agenda? Okay. Thank you, Mr. President and trustees and audience members. Um, before you is a special event permit, and this is for the FRED, which will be the second year uh, we're hosting it. It'll be September 21. Uh, FRED stands for, if I can remember, FRED in Riverside Education and Design. And it is, as far as I know, the only all-day garden design and landscape design symposium, certainly that takes advantage of Riverside and, uh, and of Olmsted's design principles. So last August, we had um, well over 100 participants from three states coming. Uh, we're looking to see equivalent, if not more, participation. Um, we have a number of top name uh, designers who will be coming. We have TV and radio personality, Mike Novak, who's just a hoot, if you've ever listened to him. Uh, and it's really designed for, um, well, people like me who know about flowers but don't have the first idea of how to put them together so that they make any kind of sense. So. Uh, I'd like to invite all of you to come, and if you have ideas for it, uh, let me or any of the FRED team know. This is sponsored by the Olmsted Society. Um, you may have seen the FRED bed out in uh, front of the library, which is a temporary exhibit just showing designs for edibles. And uh, coming up on August 26th, there'll be a demonstration of how to put together a rain barrel that doesn't look like a rain barrel. So um, thank you, and we hope we'll see you all there. Thank you very much. So other than the posted minutes, what we also have on the consent agenda is the special event application for the 8th Annual Wright Ride to be held on Sunday, August 18th, 2013, and also a motion to approve the special event application for the Riverside Junior Women's Charity Pizza Fest to be held at the train station on Saturday, September 28th, and a motion to approve the special event application for the second annual Riverside Brookfield High School Bulldog River Run to be held on Saturday, October 5th, 2013. Are there any items that? Oh, Art's here. Excellent. Well, hold on, hold on just one second. Did, did we want to pull this off, or just is it okay just to? Okay. All right, Mr. Restrepo, please. A question. I'm sorry. What's the route? Is it assuming that the path is going to be cleared, you know, or is going it? To, if we're going to discuss this, I think we should pull it from the consent agenda and then and then have Mr. Ostro explain it to us. Sure. Yeah. There's no, no harm. So do I need a motion for that, or can we just do that? Uh, no, that can just okay. be done. Okay. So uh, first, let's, let's just finish off the rest of the consent agenda. So I'd like a motion to approve the consent agenda items A through J. So moved. Second. Motion by Ms. Sussman, second by Ms. Collins. Any discussion? Please call the roll. Trustee Sussman. Aye. Trustee Pollack. Aye. Trustee Ballery. Aye. Trustee Collins. Aye. Trustee Foley. Aye. Motion carries. So now we move on to a motion to approve the special event application for the uh, Bulldog River Run. Art. Hi, my name is Art Astro. I'm the assistant principal for athletics over at Riverside Brookfield High School. Um, just wanted to thank you for the opportunity to hopefully uh, partner again with the village and uh, Riverside Parks and Rec to uh, host our second annual Bulldog River Run. Um, last year we had, I think, a little over 100, 130 runners. Um, we're hoping to you know, reach hopefully 200 this year. I know there's some questions with the course. The course that was submitted um, was with the path that Mr. Bodemer had talked about, um, but I'd already talked to Peter. If it wasn't, then we just reroute the path um, to go in front where we'd still have no road closures. And that was the big uh, difference from last year's race where we had, to do a, we had to do a bunch of road closures last year. So the whole course is inside Swan Pond. And then with that, part of the path still kind of up, up in the air of what we'll do um, regarding that end. Um, we did also have on there um, originally proposed to try to do a kayaking race too. Um, Peter had sent me a uh, email from the chief regarding safety procedures and plans and stuff that we need to have in place. So we're going to pull that for this year just because I don't think we have the time or the resources right now to get all that in order. 
um, but hopefully we can we can look at that now plan accordingly to, to maybe add that to the event next year if we do it um, but so for this year just focus on the 5k run again which uh, supports Bulldog athletics um, and and helps bring out uh, the community and bring people to the community so do they have to run that route five times I'll uh, run it twice twice okay because that's what we did last year. So you can run five times. Yeah. <laughs> you can run five times. Any other comments? Okay. Well, thank you very much. And we look forward to partnering with you again. And I especially like that you were able to determine a route that did not require road closings. So hopefully we can do that in the future for other runs that we might decide to host in the village. So with that, I would ask for a motion and a second to motion. approve. Second. Motion by Mr. Foley, second by Mr. Ballerine. Please call the roll. Trustee Sussman. Aye. Trustee Pollock. Aye. Trustee Valerie. Aye. Trustee Collins. Aye. Trustee Foley. Aye. Motion carries. Next on the agenda, as presented, are the reports of departments and commissions, but with the trustees' uh, approval, what I'd like to do is first move to the first item under ordinances and resolutions. Ms. Zucksworth is here. Uh, with regard to the variation request for the 500 Bird Road, does anybody have any objection to altering the agenda? So we will move on to the ordinance approving a variation. Michael, did you want to just give a brief summary of the uh, findings of fact from the ER? So sure. sure. Mr. Mars? Thank you, President Sells. This will be the first reading. Yes. Correct. Yes, so uh, th this concerns a uh, request for a variation from your uh, fence regulations. Your fence regulations are found in your zoning ordinance, and so uh, to do something contrary to those regulations, it, you need to go to the ZBA, and uh, they hold a public hearing, make a recommendation uh, on the proposed variation, and it comes to you for final action. Uh, in this case, it, you've seen Ms. Zuckworth's uh, presentation before. She's, she was here uh, a couple months ago talking about her situation. And her situation is that she lives on a corner lot on Bird uh, where, where the Bird sort of curves to the west, causing the houses on the west side of Bird to sit further back to the west than the structure on uh, her property. And being a corner lot, her, her rear yard is uh, situated to the north of her corner house and where she's proposing to put a fence uh, would extend into her neighbor to the north's uh, street yard, meaning her fence would be in, uh, not physically in the front yard, but uh, adjacent to the neighbor's front yard. And that's prohibited by your zoning code, which is why she is uh, seeking a variation. Um, she would only be allowed to put the fence in a very uh, narrow, portion of her yard under your existing regulations. Uh, so she came to the uh, ZBA on July 18th. Uh, we had an extended discussion um, and on, on the proposed uh, variation. And ultimately, the, uh, the ZBA was satisfied that uh, the various standards had been met. And in particular, uh, when they were talking about hardship, um, they, they were all struck by, by sort of the, the physical, uh, the severe turn that Bird makes uh, adjacent to her property, uh, which they found to be unlike uh, a lot of the other corner houses. And, and they, they unanimously uh, recommended approval of this variation as set forth in the findings of fact. Uh, they've taken under advisement uh, the board's suggestion that they uh, talk in more depth in their uh, in their findings about the findings of uh, findings of fact and, and how they feel the standards have been met as you uh, may have seen in the transcript so I found that very interesting didn't know why Normandy had hedgerows but I, found it very <laughs> I said it was in depth it was in depth <laughs> uh, I would I would like to make a motion that uh, we grant this variance but I I'd, this is a first you have to wait well, I'd also like to waive the first reading uh, I understand. I understand your feeling about waiving the first reading, but this is this has been going on since December, um, and has been going on in our boardroom since May. Um, so, I, I, if there was any um, 
if there was anybody that, that had something to say about it, they would have said they would have come here before today. Uh, so I would like to waive the first meeting, reading, and make a motion to accept this um, this variation. Hold on a sec. Let's, so let's get that out there first. We have a motion to waive the first reading. I second that motion. Motion by Mr. Ballard and second by Ms. Collins. So let's let's uh, let's take care of that issue first before we get to the second. substance of the, of the discussion. Any other comments about the waiving of the first reading? Please call the roll. Trustee Sussman. No. Trustee Pollock. Yes. I don't care. <laughs> Trustee Valerie. Yes. Trustee Collins. Yes. Trustee Foley. Yes. Motion carries. Mr. Valerie. Then I would like to make a motion that we accept the uh, the, the ordinance uh, variation. But do I have to make it so it's as the the zoning board approved. I think there was something specific about 6.2 feet, which um, Ms. Suckworth agreed to. Correct. There, were, there was a condition suggested, uh, recommended by the ZBA, that it uh, the fence be no closer than 6.2 feet uh, from the sidewalk. Is that correct? Or was it the sidewalk, Bob, or the uh, lot line? The lot line. The lot line. Because of the unique run of the property line, I think I'd be more in favor. <clears throat> it would be more legally acceptable that if we follow the setback of the front facade. So as the front facade runs back, the property line is not automatically 6.2 feet. The property line does run out a little bit. So if you would make your motion that, and that would the that facade line, the fence not be run further east and run south down the facade line of the property. And if I could just add, the, the applicant stated at the public hearing that that was her intent all along. Um, and it, you don't really need to specify that as a condition because it's in the ordinance already. It would only be if you wanted to do something other than that condition, you would need to. And today, Trustee Sussman made a very good point when we were walking the, uh, the uh, property. Um, the, the fence that was chosen here is, is, I think, a very, very nice fence. And it, and it, and you know, it goes to, to everything I preach. If you're going to do something, I'd rather have you do it right. Um, and this, this, this really does it right, and I, I appreciate that. Um, and I also appreciate your patience. Um, but let's say 15 years from now, uh, this resident is no longer there. That fence is there, and the fence falls down. The next person can't come and all of a sudden put up a four-foot picket fence that solid picket fence. It, the, this ordinance or this variation is for this fence only. I will defer to the village attorney, but it's not long been my understanding that the variation as approved runs with the property. So no one could come back and vary the design of the fence, but I would defer to the village attorney. Well, th that's an interesting question. I mean, if, if you're concerned about the look of the fence and like this particular one, I, I would suggest that you add as a condition in the ordinance that it be an open style wrought iron fence. Okay so that that is clear to future generations. Okay, then I would add that it be an open style aluminum or wrought iron fence since this is not wrought iron. Okay, sorry. Uh, so I would add that to my, to my motion. So we have a motion. I have a question. Let's get the motion and second out sure. first. We have a motion from Mr. Ballerine. A second. Second by Ms. Collins. Further discussion? Uh, Ms. Suckworth, is this stone wall uh, I just have a picture of it, and I don't even know if this is your property. Is this wall on your... I Ms. Suckman, was that retaining wall on the property when you purchased it? No, sir, but I, I did get a permit. Okay, so you, and I don't have a picture of it, but does it run? Ah, thank you. Thank you. 
If I may, Trustee Foley, that Ms. Zuckworth did call in advance of submit requesting a permit to construct that. We did meet out on the field, and it's something I did approve for installation about two years ago. Here but the fence would be coming off of that, right? No. No? The fence comes off the front, the, the furthest front facade of the structure. Okay. Which you know, we measure a street yard from the property line um, to the front facade of the structure, including eaves, not including porches, but we don't want to get back into that. Mrs. So, Zucksworth, um, one more question. Sure. Is it your intention after the fence is installed to uh, perhaps some of the stanchions or the posts of the fence to be hidden at all with any plant material to soften the fence? Um, not that we're requiring it, but is it your intention to kind of try and soften the look of the fence sure, from I, the street? I understand your concern, but I really think that um, the fence is not going to jump out at you from the street. Um, that was one of my design um, concerns or considerations by putting it interior to the bushes because if okay. you look no, on beard bird you now. see i didn't have that picture yeah so i think that over time uh it'll blend in even more right this it's not it's not the look that i'm looking for to have it jump out i'd rather have it be subtle right and and again i like trustee bellring said i applaud your use of uh of this style of fence thank you further discussion mr pollock uh, yes, uh, several things. First, um, in terms of, of the first reading versus second reading, I think we need to address that policy. I don't mind skipping second readings on everything if that's what the board wants to do, but we need to be consistent, I think, because I don't see anything really unique about this that separates it from other ordinances we may see in the future. Um, in regards to the variation, I want to say first, I want to thank the zoning board uh, for the record they provided. I think they did an excellent job of telling us why they're recommending this. Whether you agree with it or not, the record is, is, is quite clear as to why they think this should be approved. And, and I think we should uh, thank our zoning board for, for uh, conducting a, a good public hearing and, and creating a good record. Uh, in regards to the merits of the variation, uh, I think that, that the record shows that the property has unique characteristics. It, it is, it, it, there, it, it, it's, it's very unique, but of course you could say that a lot about, about a lot of properties in, in Riverside. I think the, the crux of the matter comes down to one paragraph in the petitioner's submittal, and I wish I had the page number, I don't, but and I'll, I'll read that one paragraph, it's brief. Uh, the petitioner states the current code limits potential for fence yard to less than 10% of the total property. This, this limitation does not provide a fair and reasonable use of private property in a residential zone. It is a reasonable expectation for a homeowner to be able to have some type of enclosed yard and current code does not allow this. That's the key to this whole petition in my mind. Is it reasonable to expect to have a fence in your yard. I mean, she does, is, is it reasonable to expect that every single property in the village has the right and should have the opportunity to fence in a significant portion of their yard? I think, I think if the it. answer is yes to that, then the variation should be granted. If the answer is, hey, some properties just can't accommodate a fence, I, then the I, answer is I no. think they have the right, but it's, it's the portion of their property right, that the portion they yeah. talk about fencing absolutely and, yeah um so if you if you think that someone that every property owner in the village should have the right to a reasonable backyard that is fenced then i think what the zoning board recommends makes a lot of sense mm -hmm. but if you think that some properties are just configured in a way that guess what, you don't have room for a fence, then the variation shouldn't be approved. And I think that's the question I would like to, and that's, there's no right or wrong answer to that question. It's a policy for the village board to direct to the zoning board because the village board says, hey, guess what, some properties just can't have fences 
or some properties just can't have swimming pools or whatever the case may be, then the variation hardship line is drawn at a different level. Um, and I'm not sure where I stand on that, quite frankly. I'd like to hear from the other board members. I think that was an invitation. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I, I would believe that that people should have the right to improve um, their property and maintain safety for their family, whether that be children or pets. Um, and uh, if it's done, uh, if it's done tastefully and done well, I don't have a problem with that. Um, but I, I, um, I don't like to, I don't want to say that I would, I'd like to, I, I want to be a regulator of taste. But if, um, if this fence was a, 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 a solid surface fence, I'd be less inclined to, 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 to approve it. Um, I had a picket fence that I put up 15, 18 years ago, and I thought it was, I thought it was spectacular. Um, I took it down just because it, basically fell down uh, and replaced it with a fence very similar to the one that's proposed here. And uh, the, the amount of compliments I, I get from people, um, my neighbors, uh, people that come to my house, the way the house looks, um, the way the gardens look, it's just, it's, 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 it's no longer a fence. In my mind, it's, a, it's actually, um, it's an actual interval, you know, it's a, it's a beautiful part of our, of our property now. So if things are done right, I don't have a problem with it. And I think the reason why, the whole reason why you have the variation process is so that we don't want to set it just so people can have whatever fence they want. We do want it to be restricted. But then you do offer the variation pro process so that people can come forward and, and bring uh, concerns that they have and suggestions that they have for how they want to do it. And then we can decide or, or to accept it or not. And I agree with Joe that if this was not this kind of fence, I would probably have a different opinion on this. But in this case, she has done an excellent job of picking something that fits in, that's not going to make it look, uh, you know, bad, at, like a, a stockade fence would or something like that. But that's the whole point of the process to me, is to allow this when it's appropriate. And, and if I could just, uh, before, if you look at page two of the of the history and commentary sheet that were that was provided with this, just a reminder, the I mean that sets out the three standards for for the variation. Uh, for the sake of folks at home who don't have this, the the first standard is the owner of the property in question will suffer undue hardship in the absence of a variation. Number two is the plight of the owner is due to unique circumstances. And number three is the variation, if granted, will not alter the essential character of the locality. All three standards must be met. And it was the, the unanimous opinion of the Zoning Board of Appeals that all three standards were met. Trustee Sussman. Yeah, I have a couple of questions or, or comments, actually. I just would like to remind the trustees that the zoning code itself says that there should not be a fence within the sight line, within the front yard sight line of, of the houses as you look down the street. And in fact, this would be a dramatic change from almost anywhere else in the village. In fact, there are, I can't, in fact, I can't think of another property, I know you could, shouldn't say never, right, where a fence would be five to 10 feet from a sidewalk. That's something that's never been allowed in town. And I want to say that, and I want to finish by saying that I understand the variation procedure, but I, but I also want to point out that the variation procedure is, I mean, I just want to point out that this is 10 feet. And, and as a part of that, I'd like to point out that the petitioner herself didn't have to propose a fence that came out that far. She chose to, I don't know why she chose to, she gave many reasons, but, the, but it's not, you, there's, I don't consider it a hardship that you can't fence, fence in your entire yard. And, and I understand that this is a non-conforming property. The village is full of non-conforming properties. The village is full of many corner lots where, where their fences would be prohibited as well. And um, I, I didn't hear what trustee actually, how 
Trustee Pollock actually answered his own question, but I didn't. I, I, didn't. <laughs> I actually don't think that there's an inherent right to have a fence. Um, and I certainly don't think that there's an inherent right to have a fence within 10 feet of the sidewalk in a village that has specifically stipulated that we try to minimize any kind of uh, anything, anything that's within the vista and when there are still other options available. So I, I um, have, a, have a concern with that because I don't think it's the only option. I don't think it's the only option. Um, I, I, I do think that it is a vast change from any place else in the village. And I guess I just don't think it's, um, I, I guess I just don't think it's a right to have a, a fence in the village. And, and um, I do agree with Trustee Pollock that the issue is about the right to have a fence, not the right to have a dog. Um, or a fence dog, not about having a dog, sorry. But not the right to have a fence that, uh, the size that you want for your dogs. I don't think that that's really what it is. It's, it's about the fence. Um, but I just think it's not necessary to do it the way it's being done. And then I have another comment that I don't believe that whether or not trustees think it's an attractive fence isn't, isn't so much the issue. I do have problems with the fact that the village board has has consistently said over the years that it's not a per, it's not a determiner of how pretty something is, and I don't think I, I've said this before, and, and Trustee Ballerine and I trade barbs about this lighthearted, but nonetheless barbs. Um, I don't think trustees should be doing this. If trustees believe that they should weigh in on how nice something looks, then we should set up an architectural review, or we should make that a part of the zoning. But I don't think that's a part of the zoning. Having said that, I, um, I don't know how the majority is going to vote, but I would also like to say that as a part of this, I'd like to, if we decide to proceed, I'd like to amend it regardless, such that, that hiding the fence with bushes always be a part of the variation. So I understand that we've already said that the fence can't be torn down and, and replaced with a wooden fence. Um, but I'd also like to say that, the, that, that bushes be in place in front of the fence and that that be a part of the variation procedure so that the next homework, homeowner, this is not about, about you, I know you're intent on leaving your lovely arborvitae there, I, I saw them, they were very nice, but that they not be torn out so that you can see the fence because that is, it's the only place in Riverside then where you'd have that fence. I have no problem with that. Um, Mr. Mars, is that, is that a restriction that can appropriately be attached yes. to them? Absolutely. That they maintain the the bushes. Some landscape screening on the street side of the fence. So would you like to make a motion to I amend? just, can we make it a friendly amendment if everybody agrees? Sure, if, if the motion or a second are accepted. Joe, would you call that friendly? I will, I will uh, amend <laughs> my motion to include Trustee Sussman's um, plant additions. Plant I'm screening. Okay, I still, Appropriate plant I'm still screening. not in favor of it, but that makes it. Makes you feel better? That makes me feel better, <laughs> Joe, thank you. I make, I amend the motion to include plant screening. Sucksworth, did you want to? I did have a question because this is this um, fence project of mine keeps evolving into all different things that I hadn't really even considered. So, if you're attaching um, a landscape uh, qualifier, if you will, if I choose to change bushes, am I coming back to see you all? No. No. Okay. I just wanted. It just has to be hidden at all times. Yeah. I just the next have one. I, I have one more question about the size. Um, Bob, uh, side fences, um, I just want to talk for one second about side fences. They're not allowed to come past the front of the house. So let's say I had a fence running down the side of my house. I can keep it at four feet up into the front of my house, right? Mm -hmm. I can't go past the front. Are you talking about this specific lot or just a lot in general? I'm just talking about a lot in general. A lot in general, we get something in the mid block. You can start from the front facade of your house. You're allowed to go four feet high for the first 40 feet. Okay. After that, you can continue all the way to the back, around your rear property line, back all the way up until you're 40 feet shy of the front facade again where it has to taper down, and the maximum height in the rear yard is six foot. In this particular case, uh, Ms. Sucksworth's lot line that adjoins the street yard of the neighbor is considered the rear lot line. Mm -hmm. um, technically, 
she would be entitled to a six foot fence. But since it's a street yard, she's not allowed to put anything there, which posed the variation. What are her setbacks for? No setbacks. You can go right to the property line, or if it's not going to be on the property line, the code says you need to be three foot off the property line. So in her particular case, it wouldn't matter too much. In a mid block case, if you have a fence and you want to move something back, there's no way to maintain it for anything to, blow, to grow up. So they want a three foot off the, the lot line. So in the summer, if the weeds pop up, someone can get back there and clean it. In this particular case, as the, lot, as the fence moves from her rear lot line, which is the northern lot line, as it starts moving south, that is still considered her rear yard. Technically, a rear yard, you can have a six foot fence. By having to go to the variation, the applicant chose to go to four feet. Anybody else could have a six foot so fence. So we're gonna to continue to call this a rear yard, not a street yard, which is really what it is. The street, street yard, yard. Cease, street yard ceases, it ceases at, the back of the, at the back of the property or her attached garage. She has a principal street yard on Long Common. She has a secondary street yard on Bird. The secondary street yard runs from the front facade to the rear of the structure. After that, projecting to the front facade of the secondary street yard, that is a street yard okay. on the secondary line. By holding the fence back to the front facade and extending that line rearward, that is now a rear yard. So I think what it is is until you get to the back of the garage, it's actually a side yard. That's a snow. At the back of the garage, even though it's just, if you're looking at it, it's the same length at the back of the garage, it then becomes the backyard. It, it is a secondary street yard. So the, coast calls. the reason Crazy. I brought this up was to see if it, that uh, this one piece of fence could be more aligned with the front facade of the home. So the fence wouldn't project past the front of the house. It's, it's not, not intended house. to. That's agreed to be done, not to go any Mike, further east. So you are agreeing to do Mike, it. Mike, it's not about her house. It's about the neighbor's house. I, un I understand yeah. that. I understand it. But it is still in this drawing projecting past the residence's home. If we were to go to that, we would have needed a second variation to encroach into the secondary front. That's yard. what I'm concerned okay. about. Okay. Oh, I get it. Okay. It's considered a rear yard at the end of the garage. You're not coming back for another variation, right? No. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, what, what, the, what the zoning board had uh, come to a unanimous recommendation on with the 6.2 um, feet setback from the property line on Bird is what I had in mind. I understand that a couple trustees came to my property today and if you could visualize, I'm, I'm going to be cutting the grass back, the, the grass edge back about another foot to be in compliance and working with Bob. You know, it's my intention to have it all staked out. And I'm sure he wants to see exactly where the fence is going to be. Further discussion? Yes. Mr. Pollock? Um, I think there, there's two steps to, to any variation. The first is, establishing whether there's a unique condition to the property that creates hardship and if we agree or if the majority of the board feels that there is a, a right a reasonable expectation that a property owner should have that they could have a fenced backyard then i think the condition those those findings have been met uh, even when the findings are met however it's our responsibility as a village board to mitigate the impact of a deviation from the code. And I think the way we're mitigating the impact of the deviation from the code is by requiring, and I want that as a, I, I do agree completely, it's a very specific condition that the fence be exactly the fence that's shown in the petitioner's submittal, an aluminum decorative uh, style fence. That mitigates the impact. That's why we're regulating the aesthetics here is because they are deviating from the code and so we have to require an open fence because the impact on the community would be very different if it was a solid wood fence. Uh, the same with the bushes. Uh, that mitigates the impact of deviating from the code. Uh, and I would uh, agree that that should be a specific condition of the variation approval. The third concern I have, and I'll just throw this out there, uh, 6.2 feet that doesn't seem like enough to me. Uh, there. The zoning board relied on the very closest point of the house to the property line. 
and say, okay, that's where you can have your fence. I kind of think it's more logical to go to the midpoint, uh, which would be more like 13 feet back. Uh, I mean, you could make an argument that it should be in line with the garage and no further to the street than the garage. I'm willing to go halfway and say, okay, that midpoint, that is, I think, 6.2 plus 3.8 plus 3 feet uh, from the front lot line is where the fence can be. Because 6.2 is awfully close to the street. If I may. Please. Should, if the property would qualify, I can say was I did not do this calculation, the applicant would be able to build an addition to that front line of 6.2. Um, if provided in that lot coverage, uh, permeable it's, services. It's fine if they do that, we'll revisit the variation. They could build forward to that 6.2 with an addition should. That's, that's that fine, and I, I'll go on record as saying if, if they do that, then maybe we can revisit this. But right now, it, it doesn't exist, and I think. The 6.2 does exist. Right, but but the addition you're talking about doesn't exist. But your, your, your point of mitigating the fence, I, 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 um, which I agree with you 100%, as you move the fence farther back on the lot line, you lose that mitigation because it gets farther from the bushes. Um, I don't know the exact dimension, but I would say you're probably six and a half to seven feet from the sidewalk. How far is to the back of the bush? It, the property line is about, the property line is actually about 18 inches or um, uh, the property line is about 18 inches or two feet interior to the sidewalk. And then there's another 6.2 inches 6.2 feet beyond that. So the buffer between the sidewalk and the fence is more around eight or yeah. nine feet. Right. It's not really, I mean, 6.2, you're seeing that, but the property line, if you see the line, I don't know what page it is in your packet, but there's an area between the sidewalk and the property line before you get to my property lines. Yeah, the plan of survey that. shows that it's probably about one foot from but the sidewalk to the property line. Inch, six feet two inches from the, the proposal, close from the property the of the property. The proposal was the street yard setback of six point two feet. Right from the property. That's what we yeah. see. From the closest piece of the property. From the, to property, the property line, line to the to front the, to the front facade of the secondary front yard street yard, which puts the fence right along your bush line. Interior right. of my bush line. The interior yeah. of your bush line. And if you can uh, probably actually, just, and that, that actually, because you have one one bush at the farthest part of your property that actually comes back a little bit. It's not in a straight angle, so you're actually right. going to probably actually lose a little bit more. So from a mitigation standpoint, if we move it farther back from that line, you actually lose that that the mitigation of the plants, or you're going to you have to plant more bushes. I think right now the way she has it, she, it will be right behind the bushes, and and I I. I these color pictures that, that she sent us, I don't know if you, you saw these. Um, I, I, you, you barely even see this fence. So what I, about I, from the north? From the north. Is there, there's green on the north side? There's a, there's a bush all the way across uh, the north side of the fence. Yeah. Yeah. There's, a heavy, there's a heavy bush line all along the north side of the property. Oh, that, that's not for my burn. Right. No, it's that's true. I'm, I'm still probably. more comfortable with, with with it being further back, I mean, even if we were to say, you know, additional bushes have to be planted, I just think as, as a matter of precedent and as a matter of, you know, it just, you know, so 6.2 feet from the right of way is. Do you, do you have a specific amendment in mind? I, yeah, I would uh, suggest the amendment that the condition be that the fence be located no closer to the street than, let me do my math here, it would be, 13 feet from the property line. And that would line up with that middle section of the house. So we have a motion to amend to increase the distance to 13 feet. Do we have a second? I will amend my motion to accept that. Second. So we have a motion. We have two motions on the table. No, we don't. No, this is a motion to amend the existing, the existing motion. So the motion before you is to amend the 6.2 setback to 13 feet. We have the motion by Mr. Pollock and a second by Ms. Sussman. 
Are there, is there any further discussion on the amendment? I, on I, the have, amendment have, uh, I, I think that it's a wise amendment. As I said, I don't think there's anywhere else in the village where we permitted a sidewalk to be in the, I guess it would be eight feet from the, the um, sidewalk, where we permitted a fence to be within eight feet. And, and I don't think the question should be where are the current bushes. I don't think that that's the proper determination of where a fence goes. I think the proper determination of where the fence goes is the proper determination of the, where the fence should, fence should be. And I still maintain that um, it's just, you know, it's, it's something that's not, that we've never permitted anywhere else. And, and there's still land there so that the fence, so that there could still be privacy or there, and there could still be a, a fenced-in area. It just needn't come 6.2 feet from the property line. It's a further discussion, but please limit it to the amendment about the 13 feet very There much. are properties that uh, the petitioner listed that do have the fence uh, right on the sidewalk. I mean, at 689 Selwyn, the house is on the sidewalk. And it, I think it is within one foot of the sidewalk. And there are several more that I didn't list. Yeah. I, I mean, I if, if you look at the corner of Long Common and um, Selborne, the f of the four houses there, two of them have fences on the sidewalk. Then the question is, are they legal? And that's all. Yes. And the, if they're not legal, then that, that's, irre they have that's been, irrelevant. They, those have been approved by the village. Yes. They were either legal non-conforming because they were but there but they were prior approved. to the ordinance. The 689 cell phone was put in two years ago. They were two years ago. The has a swimming pool in it, which so is another So that's different. Situation. So by law, the swimming pool, swimming pool has to. But the fence is on the sidewalk. But it also has bushes to, to um, and they've also put in the black wrought iron type fence. And so it does look, it looks fine. And I just, I think that we are just really um, limiting what the petitioner can do with their property. And I just, I feel terrible for this petitioner is what they have gone through with this. And I just don't want this to be, I understand that we want to maintain the village, but I don't want this to be what residents or businesses have to go through in this town to have something done. She's trying to improve her property. Um, I think she's done an excellent job with it. And it's not just about that I think it looks pretty. It's that I think that she has done the most she can to mitigate any type of disruption. And I'm just very frustrated at this point that we are doing this to a petitioner. So. So. And I would argue that that's not a reason for approving it. I, I respect that, and I'm very sorry that she's had to go through that in itself is not a reason for approving Except it. Except that okay. we are limiting what a person can do with their property. But to that's a the level. whole idea of a, ver of a code. No, but the, okay. the point Excuse of a code me. is, but the point of the variation is to allow let's, the petitioner. Let's, let's not lose no, our focus here. Not. We're not talking about the variation at this point. We're talking about the amendment to move from 6.2 to 13. Well, that's what we're talking about. And, right? I, would, and I would say that the 13 feet encroaches on her property so much that I would, I would think she, she probably doesn't even have to go through the variation process. Sure she does. No, because 13 feet puts it back so far in her yard that it's probably not far off of what she could have done so, legally. No, no that's not true. If you extend the, if you extend the front facade. How far from the north, tree? Army? How far from the tree? It's not the tree. tree. It's the yeah, back of the tree. garage, Jeff. I understand where the, I understand where the, the tree is, but the, at 13 feet, where does that fall for, like, for example, the patio? It would be east of the patio. 13 feet looking here was going to be some way about two thirds up the drive. What she is allowed legally is probably about 10 feet off of that yes. western property line. That is where the so facades, that's where the facades of the Bird Street comes in. Instead of 400 square feet of back, fenced backyard, this variation gives her 37 by 40. 1,200 something square feet of backyard. I see what you're saying, but I, I, I still think that it's it's best that we we go with the uh, recommendation of the CBA. They 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 studied this. They went over it. They voted six six zero uh, unanimous. Um, I think you know for us to overturn it, it has to be blatant, and I don't I don't see it in this case. Okay, so let's let's move forward to a vote on the on the amendment, the proposed amendment to alter the 6.2 to 13 feet. That's the only thing we're voting on. It's just that question. So, if you'll please call the roll on the amendment only. And this is for the 13 feet. Yes. Okay. Uh, Trustee Sussman. Aye. Trustee Pollock. Aye. Trustee Ballery. No. Trustee Collins. No. Trustee Foley. No. Motion fails. We're back to the discussion on the merits with regard to <coughs> approving the variation for the fence with a 6.2 setback and the bushes to be remaining intact, or bushes of various kinds to remain intact. 
Any further discussion? Hearing none, please call the roll. Trustee oh, Sorrell. you know what? Let's just let's make sure we're absolutely clear on this. Mr. Mars, can you give us the precise motion that we're voting on? Sure. Uh, here's what I have to this point. Uh, motion to approve the ordinance granting a variation to allow a rear yard fence on a corner lot at 500 Bird Road <coughs> that would extend into the street yard of the adjoining property uh, with the following conditions. Number one, that the fence extend no further east than six feet two inches from the east lot line of the property consistent with the easternmost extension of the footprint of the residents on the property. Number two, that the variation be limited now and in the future uh, to an open style wrought iron or decorative aluminum construction uh, style fence. And three, that the area between the fence and the eastern lat line be screened by the owner with bushes or other landscaping. Are we all clear on that? Is it clear on what screening means? I mean, is, you know, does it hide the fence or let's, because my idea was that it should hide the fence. Like she does now. Everybody yeah, I, I'm just saying fence. screening consistent with the existing landscaping well, to be maintained. Because yeah. I, mean, I think we all agree what's existing there is adequate, don't we? Or do yeah, we yeah, yeah. But yeah. Is, that, is that enough for the... I think so. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the, I mean, the, the, photographs are, the photos are part of the record. Oh, okay. <laughs> all right, hearing no further discussion, please call the... the uh, Trustee vote. Sussman. No. Trustee Pollock. No. Trustee Ballerine. Yes. Trustee Collins. Yes. Trustee Foley. Yes. Uh, it is an ordinance that requires four votes for approval. Uh, the, there being three votes in favor, President Sells, you do have the option to vote. If you I vote yes. Okay. Motion carries. But that came to Sucksworth. Okay. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. So we now return to our original agenda order. Next up is reports of departments and commissions. And tonight we have a report from the Planning Commission on special use and permitted use designations. Uh, Attorney Mars. Thank you. Um, like the ZBA, the Planning Commission has been uh, busy with various things. And uh, one thing they were working on recently was an initiative suggested by President Sells here a couple months ago and then uh, sent to the plan commission at the direction of the board. And that was to examine uh, the permitted and special use tables in the business districts uh, within the zoning code with an eye towards whether it's necessary in, uh, in all the existing cases to have certain things designated as a special use. Uh, which requires people to, business owners who want to uh, cite particular things designated as a special use to come in, pay, pay a fee, have a, go through the public hearing process before the plan commission and then come here for final approval before they're able to establish uh, particular uses. And so uh, with the board's direction in mind, the plan commission at a recent meeting went through those use tables and reached a consensus on considering uh, changing certain uh, special uses to permitted uses. And they've sent uh, that, that's a summary of that and a list to you. Uh, and what we're looking for at this point is, is a direction to the plan commission to go ahead and, and hold a public hearing on whether these uh, amendments to the zoning code uh, should be made. And so by sending it to them, you're not saying you agree with each and every one of these. You're just saying go ahead and take the next step of holding a public hearing and bring back to us as a board a recommendation on, uh, on particular amendments to the code. And just running uh, through these uh, for the benefit of, of everybody real quick, um, in, in the B1, uh, and the, and the B2, actually, in all the business districts, they're suggesting uh, taking restaurants with outdoor cafes uh, and making those permitted uses as opposed to special uses. And part of the, the theory behind that is you already have a set of regulations on, on what outdoor cafes have to do in order to, to be an outdoor cafe, and, and that's existing within your, your village code already. And so it was felt that the step, possibly the step of having them go through the special use process was unnecessary because they've already got to comply with various things, uh, insurance requirements and, and uh, fencing and all those sorts of things. Uh, 
The next recommendation concerned brew pubs and craft distilleries, again in the B1, and uh, the retail core portion of the B2. Uh, those were recently enacted regulations. Uh, at the time, it was decided they should be a special use, um, but they, they are liquor serving establishments. There's other li liquor related regulations that govern those. Uh, so it's suggested that those be permitted instead of special uses or that that, that be considered at a public hearing. And then tavern and lounges in the retail uh, core, as well as art galleries uh, in the mixed use periphery. Those are permitted use in the retail core, but they're a special use in the mixed use periphery. It's suggested that we consider making them permitted uses in the mixed use periphery. And then uh, the uh, several members of the plan commission had seen the board's uh, discussion of the CMAP priorities. And so they were eager to, to get started on some of those initiatives. So we also talked about bed and breakfast, um, developing a, uh, a set of regulations related to those and installing those as permitted uses uh, in some of the districts, as well as rental kiosks for uh, various recreational uses. Uh, bikes were discussed at the train station, uh, the possibility of, of renting kayaks and canoes. Um, so they, they were interested in discussing those as well. And then, uh, there's also, they started a discussion on uh, retail uses in the mixed use periphery um, and, and whether that should become a permitted use as opposed to a special use. And they uh, didn't complete that discussion, uh, but our proposal is to, you know, bring this back to them as part of the overall uh, th package of things that they're going to discuss uh, and bring a final recommendation to you on. So uh, what they're looking for tonight is just direction to go ahead and hold that public hearing on all these uses. And again, you know, by directing them to do that, you're not saying, hey, I'm, I'm okay with all these, but you're just giving them the, the power to move forward. So I'd ask for, let's get a motion and second so on the floor you first. Do we need a motion for this? Yeah, I was gonna. Yeah. You do? Okay. I'd like to make a motion that we direct the planning commission or authorize the planning commission to conduct a public hearing to consider the amendments to the zoning ordinance as outlined in the uh, July 25th letter from Attorney Mars. Motion by Mr. Pollock. I'll second that. Second by Mr. Foley. Discussion? Ms. Sussman? I think that this is fabulous. I'd like to commend the Plan Commission for moving so quickly and so being so creative. Uh, and I'm glad that to see that they're suggesting that we also look at bed and breakfast in residential areas, and I'm sure they'll come up with good guidelines for that. Um, I recall from being on the Plan Commission that people actually did come out when we started, I don't know if you remember, Mr. Sells, but um, when we started talking about the business periphery areas, so the, the areas, Pat, that aren't right, right downtown, people came out to talk about what they wanted to see in their own neighborhoods, and I think it should be very interesting, and I'm really glad that this is happening. So thanks to the Plan Commission. Further discussion? Well, I, and, um, I was at that Miller Meadows dog park uh -huh. the other day. Um, and you know, it's more than a dog park. Um, they're actually putting a canoe, they're talking about putting a, a canoe uh, portage there, um, which would be you know, very exciting to, to, because now all of a sudden you can tie not too far from home and, and come all the way down into Riverside. It, 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 I think this, this type of thing, is, is is we're just we're we're they're getting ahead of the game, which I think is yeah. Wonderful. And and I'd like to suggest that the plan commission, if there are pieces of this that are are simpler, less complicated in terms of of resident response, um, that they give it to us in pieces so that we can move forward. So, for instance, if it's easier to deal with the central business district as opposed to the periphery areas then let's hear a recommendation on that and let's move forward because this is another one of these low-hanging fruits that, that President Sells refers to with respect to the, C, to the CMAP plan. Mr. Pollock? I just uh, wanted to, to follow up with a comment on some of these zoning changes. I, when the Planning Commission reviews this and forwards a recommendation to the board, I would like to have uh, a somewhat detailed report from the village staff on uh, what other regulations the village has in terms of the liquor code and municipal code that regulates outdoor cafes, restaurants, and businesses that serve alcoholic beverages. Uh, because it, this is a very progressive amendment. Yeah. There's very few, if any, communities, I don't know of any communities that allow these types of uses outright. I'm sure there are some. I'm sure it's not uncommon, but 
but it is somewhat unique. And I'm fine, I think I'm fine with that, but I want to know that our residents are protected by other aspects of the municipal code, noise regulations, uh, public uh, nuisances, whatever, you know, so that we know if we have a problem business in the future that we have other means outside of zoning to, to regulate that. I would actually suggest that that be made as part of the presentation at the public hearing yes. so that residents who are in, in attendance can understand the, the existing protections already in place. Absolutely. Further comment? Please call the roll. Trustee Sussman? Aye. Trustee Pollock? Aye. Trustee Ballerine? Aye. Trustee Collins? Aye. Trustee Foley? Aye. Motion carries. And I join you, Ms. Sussman, in your comments. I'm very excited about this. It's great to see our commissions grab hold of something like this and move quickly. So I really appreciate their, their hard work on this. Next up is a resolution authorizing the village manager to enter into an agreement with Air One Equipment for the purchase of 30 self-contained breathing apparatus in an amount not to exceed 186, oh, $182,520. Chief Camara. Thank you, President Sells and the trustees and village managers, Calera. I have uh, two uh, considerations uh, resolutions for items to be purchased um, from the fire department, to be utilized in the fire department. First is the um, Riverside Fire Department has researched and evaluated several, several different manufacturers of self-contained breathing apparatus, or SCBAs. The department has chosen MSA M7 Firehawk SCBA. These units meet and exceed the National Fire Protection Association standard 1981-1982, the 2012 standard. These units will allow our firefighters to work with reliable and compliant SCBAs while operating on emergency scenes. The action proposed is approval of resolutions authorizing the village manager to enter into an agreement with Air One Equipment. <coughs> sole source vendor for the purchase of 30 self-contained breathing apparatus in the amount not to exceed $182,520. As you recall, last year um, we had this discussion um, that during the CIP budget discussions that um, whether or not we should include this for the purchase for 2013. Uh, last year we uh, applied for a FEMA federal grant um, and the status of that grant as of this week is that we have not yet been denied. Um, upon a call with the director from Region 5, which is the area that handles Illinois, the person that's in charge of the federal grant, he said it's probably unlikely. There is one, two more grant awards that's gonna happen in September and October until the monies are, are, um, are run out on the federal side. So. But it looks like that we will not be able to be awarded that, that grant. With that said, um, we need to, the fire department needs to go ahead and look at replacements for SCBAs. Um, there's a couple things that are um, driving that decision. Uh, one is we have reached the end use of the bottles that we currently use. Um, they have a 15-year life. Um, they have, every three years, we have to get those hydrally static tested. Um, they're fiberglass composite bottles. And so every three years, we're gonna make sure that they um, are pressure tested and make sure they're safe. They can only do that five times. So um, January 1st is when we've reached that 15th um, year, so we're actually not compliant with the current um, hydrostatic testing requirements. The other um, decision point that we're looking at is the parts that we have for the SCBAs. We've been notified by the manufacturer that they will not, no longer be um, carrying the, the parts to replace the current SCBAs. So with 2012 standards, um, that NFPA have set, um, there is a mad rush, if you will, um, for departments to look at the new compliancy of SCBAs. 
um, NFPA had met last year and made several different recommendations um, to enhance firefighter safety. And some of those, um, many of those um, recommendations are now standards, um, which this is the first, um, this is the first order that the major MSA manufacturer is rolling out based on those standards to be uh, complied with 2012 um, NFPA standards. So there's a, um, I come before you at this particular time because we are in, I have the opportunity to get on board with many other departments and have a, a, a um, pretty good cost savings um, if we can get that order in by mid-August. Chief, I have two questions, one for you and probably one for Jessica. Um, if for some reason we, we do get awarded the grant, we could still take advantage of it even though we've purchased them already, correct? I believe it would have to deal more with the billing. And since I didn't apply for the grant, I'm going to ask Spencer more or less what the logistics were as it was outlined in, in the grant um, application. I, I believe we have a time period once we're awarded the grant that um, we can apply and, and get reimbursed even if we went ahead and purchased them. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and secondly, Jessica, last December we talked about this and we decided to, I thought we decided to go ahead and purchase these things. And we talked about the money coming out of the CIP. And we only had at that time, I believe, $82,000 left in the CIP. It, during the CIP planning process, initially, when we first embarked on that journey, it was put in as grant contingent. The grant contingency was removed after discussion by the board that we were going to go forth and purchase them regardless. Even with that purchase, we're still projecting to have approximately $80,000 remaining in CIP at the end of fiscal year 2013. Okay, so, okay, so this does so not- So that was included, okay. correct. Okay. Thank you. Sure. So we're sure about what you said, that if we move ahead <laughs> purchasing these and then we get the grant, we're going to be able to be reimbursed from the grant. <laughs> I, you're putting me on a spy. I can't. I can't be sure. Was there? Is there any so, reason not to wait till November to buy them? Well, yeah. There's two reasons. One is we have the opportunity for cost savings right now. So I need. There's a. We were contacted by the manufacturer that they're first putting the, this big order in. That there's a significant cost savings by because getting we'll on. Because we'll be participating with a number of other departments that are purchasing the same type of unit, so we'll be able to take advantage of the unit pricing at a discounted rate by putting our order in with the other departments by mid-August. If we wait until November, the unit price goes up. And, and number two is that we're currently not compliant with our air bottles because they don't meet the hydro. So, Chief, they, is there a risk if you were to contact the grantor and ask that question? I did. And I, mean, I did. The question about he, he said it's unlikely that we're going to be no, no, aware. I mean, about if we were to go ahead and purchase them oh, and yeah, still I, yes. receive the grant, would because you could because it will be cheaper and because we're not compliant. Is there a yeah, risk to, if you to, do that? To get to to uh, President Sell's point, yes. There's. I mean, we can contact them just to make sure I mean, what really would happen if we were <laughs> awarded the grant. But the likelihood. Um, uh, of us getting it, um, because I think in, in speaking with Spencer, there are a few departments that are still out there that are potential candidates that, because of their financial right. condition, are probably going to get money before we do. And that's what I recall from the initial discussion. That's correct. Is the grant to cover the full cost of it or a partial cost? Um, it covers, we would be responsible for one third of the cost. Is it possible that we can pay one third of the yeah. price? You're talking to the manufacturer, or is all the money required up front? No, that wouldn't be, we, that would not be <laughs> worked out with that the manufacturer. That was the last <laughs> We're trying. Pat, we're trying. Yeah, when, 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 when is the, when, yeah, when, 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 delivery? Two-thirds on delivery. <laughs> and we don't want delivery until after the grant process is done. Well, so do we, do when, we. When do, when do we have to have the order in? There. In order to take, in order to take. I'm, I've been told mid-August. Is that after August 15th? I'm sure if 
you know, we pushed them to the end, you know, towards the end of August. With that That's what I was going to so. suggest is why don't we put this on the consent agenda for the August 15th meeting? And Would it well, matter one way or another? Well, no, because then Chief Kamara has a chance to make that phone call. But, but the question is, if he came but, back and said, no, you can't be reimbursed, and we all know that we have a very small chance of getting the grant. Right. Would it change? Is it going to change how we feel about it? I guess that's, that's why I suggested putting it on the consent agenda. Right, but I'm I'm just saying for me, I don't think it would affect my vote. Are you willing to take the risk and right. pay the more, the higher cost, not taking advantage we're of not, this? We're not we're not taking a risk. That's the point. If no, we, Jean's no, point that's is, what I'm saying. I'm you saying you would be uh, taking the risk if we. Um, her point is, your answer is going to be yes either way. Yeah, that's because fine. we're not going to lose this cost savings. If that's the question. Regardless yeah. of whether the grant is reimbursable or not. So would it affect our decision if, if the chief were to come back and say, if you buy these up front, uh, you can't be reimbursed, or you can't be reimbursed within two months, or you know whatever it would be, knowing that we stand a fairly small chance of getting the grant? I guess that's what I'm asking. But we would have and to Trustee Collins' point, if we wait any longer, then you know it's going to cost us more. What is the significant cost savings? No, that's fair. That's a good question. Yeah, and that's a good question. And, and, and I tried to press the, the answer to that, but the manufacturers didn't want to so the, provide the, that. The person so. that's selling us won't tell us the significant cost savings that we're saying. I, yeah, I, you know. Are they the sole supplier of the They are. Yeah, it's, it goes by, goes by the state. So. I, so. I just had a quick question. Uh, the bells and whistles of the product itself. Is it? Compatible with other departments' units. I mean, will our bottles interchange with other companies? Um, they will, and we have a software package that we're purchasing as part of this package that other uh, departments are utilizing the same system. So Pleasant View Fire District is using the same MSA um, bottles and SCBAs and the wireless software that com comes with that. So rehab will be able to take care of the bottles as well as so we, we won't have to repurchase a, a filling machine for station two? That's correct. This is, this is um, SCBA bottles and compatible with, the, with everything that we're using. But okay. unfortunately, we can't separate the masks or right. any of the other parts of the SCBAs. But everything else that goes with that um, is compatible. The compressors, the fittings, do, things like that. Do they that. have the technology yet to track the firefighters on the SCBAs? Close. Their location? Close. This system will be able to monitor the air supply of firefighters. And if they, they have a, um, a, a key card swipe that is unique to that firefighter, so they can actually um, swipe that in their SCBA pack and then a laptop outside the building will know who that person is and then we'll be able to monitor their air and then we will have the capabilities of outside to be able to send an evacuation signal if um, you know the fire had deteriorated where we need to evacuate we could send them an evacuation signal to all the firefighters that have this system to evacuate and then the firefighters have an acknowledgement on their their uh, mask so that command or whoever's at the laptop could see that they've acknowledged that message so there's a there's a lot of things that that this whole package does enhance firefighter safety so um, <clears throat> That's and that's you'll part still of this be proposal. Able to body breathe off of them and, uh, Correct. That's a new standard too. Okay. So there's a few things on a new standard is that they each firefighter will have um, a body breathing uh, hose capabilities. The other thing is they their mask have to meet a, a thermal threshold. Right now our mask um, could could begin to melt and become pliable less than 200. Now they have to meet a minimum of 500 degrees and maintain that for a certain amount of time. Um, there's speaking um, diaphragm um, clarity requirements for the masks now. Um, so there's a lot of safety enhancements that NFPA has looked at uh, firefighter fatalities uh, throughout the years, and they've looked at the SCBA ensembles, and that they've made this changes in that standard. And, and so there's no doubt that this is going to enhance our, our firefighter safety. Thank you, sir. I, 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 I'll, I'm not willing to... to um, jeopardize the safety of our firefighters. I don't care 
I, I, I grant or no grant. I mean, I think I said this back in December. We should have ordered them back then. So um, I would make a motion that we that we place the order for these. But I would I would I because I, as I I believe that we sh we as you think we're 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 in a financial position where other municipalities are going to be get that money before we were. Um, so I think it's important for us to protect our firefighters. Um, but I would also like to say that uh, it would it would be um, uh, it would behoove you to make that phone call, and 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 I can, and, and, I can get that. And I can't function. believe that a, that a, that a, an organization that that gives grants to a firefighting firefighters would say no because you went out and bought them. We're not going to give you the money. I mean, they, they have to would understand that you know we're we're doing it because of the safety of our firefighters. And if we qualify for the grant, they would they would still give us that money. But I would I would definitely ask you to make that phone call. I will. If we order them in mid or now or whatever, when is delivery? Do you have any idea? Um, that I that I don't have an answer for. Okay. I can find out for you. So. Gets the answer or no? I I I I I have to agree. I have to agree with you, Gene. I, I I don't care if the decision. If my answer is going to be yes today, yeah, it's, it's going to be yes two weeks from now. Yes. Okay. So we have so we have a motion to approve the resolution by Mr. Ballerine. So. Second by Ms. Collins. Further discussion? <clears throat> Please call the roll. Trustee Sussman. Aye. Trustee Pollock. Aye. Trustee Ballerine. Aye. Trustee Collins. Aye. Trustee Foley. Aye. Motion carries. Next up is a resolution authorizing the village manager into, to enter into an agreement with CCI flooring for the refinishing of the floors at the fire station. Chief Kamura. The floors at fire station one have not been resurfaced. Uh, nor refinished since 1999. The area below this floor was originally used as a gun range by, by the police department, but has since been transformed into administrative offices and evidence storage space. It is essential to have proper, properly installed and waterproofing floor above these offices, especially when fired vehicles are parked on this floor. The existing floor surface has several cracks in areas where the floor is spalling. The existing surface will be removed bare concrete, cracks and imperfections repaired, and new waterproof membrane flooring applied. Proposals were sought for multiple vendors. The proposal recommends, uh, recommended was lowest responsible proposal and completes the project under budget amount. Approval of the resolutions waiving competitive bidding and authorize the village manager to accept the proposal and enter an agreement with CCI Flooring Incorporated for refurnishing of the floor as floors at fire station one in the amount not to exceed 24,148. I'd ask for a motion and a second. So moved. Motion by Ms. Sussman. Second. Second by Mr. Ballerine. Discussion? Chief, do you want to say anything about this? Because I think your office is underneath that. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> He's going to be happy. No um, <laughs> <laughs> I have a couple of questions. Chief Kamara, could you help me understand why you're asking us to waive competitive bidding? I'm always concerned when we waive competitive bidding. Mm -hmm. Well, we do have actually uh, other two other quotes that were. It says out. waive competitive know, bidding. That, that shouldn't be in there. It's, okay. We did we obtain did two, three two other quotes right. for that. Okay, and so just as a just moving forward, it would be good to have the quotes all attached. If just moving forward with other bids, I think President says we had talked about that at one point. So that would be great because obviously we didn't know that. Um, and then this was a, a part of the CIP for 2013, right? That's correct. And so we're you're here tonight because it exceeds the discretionary spending of the village president of the village manager. Right. So I, I'm in favor of doing this and I'm in favor of doing this. <laughs> <laughs> Further discussion? Please call the roll. Aye. Trustee Pollock. Aye. Trustee Bellary. Aye. Trustee Collins. Aye. Trustee Foley. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you, Chief Kamara. Thank you. Next up are considerations, and this is a completion of our discussion that we began at our last meeting for on the uh, Village of Riverside Capital Improvement Plan 2023. Finance Director Francis. Last, at the last board meeting, we had discussed the capital improvement plan, and there were some outstanding items as it relates to policy guidance for staff as we go into the budget planning process for fiscal year 2014. 
um, one of the major items and or components is the budget philosophy of the new board. In past years, it would be current revenues equal current expense. And what exactly that means is any revenue that was derived in fiscal year 2014, um, the expenses would not exceed that. That becomes problematic from the perspective of we actually have certain assignments with regard to our fund balance. For example, parks and recreation. If they want to get at that money, we, they would not be able to because of the current versus current perspective. Um, so my recommendation for the board would be to allow staff to budget, allowing them to utilize, instead of current versus current, um, allow them to utilize current funding sources equals current expenses. And so that would essentially allow us to utilize any type of fund balance assignments that are currently available in addition to any unassigned fund balance if it's warranted. And so that would be an item for discussion by the village board as to what their philosophy will be for fiscal year 2014. Why don't you go ahead and, and outline and, the second and one the and, then, and then we'll take them one at a time. The following item um, that we discussed, um, but I don't believe that there was any conclusion on, was with regard to the Capital Projects Fund. And I, as I mentioned previously, it's projected that we'll have approximately $80,000 remaining within the Capital Projects Fund at the end of this fiscal year. So we need to decide how we're going to be funding capital for fiscal year 2014. It is my recommendation that we that um, the village board commit to funding capital for fiscal year 2014. However, we not assign a dollar amount. We're just committing that we're going to fund it. Staff will review the list, provide a finalized list, because the capital improvement plan is very fluid. It changes regularly. Um, so this is not a finalized list that was attached, because the village manager still has to review it. And there could be changes between now and the presentation of the actual budget to the village board. Um, so I, I recommend that the village board um, allow the, the funding of capital for fiscal year 2014, and we'll provide what that final number is um, during the budget process. And those are the two items that are remaining. And given that, that'll provide us guidance for putting together fiscal year 2014. Your second point, what you're asking us to do is fund the capital improvement plan, correct? Basically. Not in totality for fiscal year 2014. Right. You're, you're asking us to fund 2014 capital improvement plan. I'm, I'm asking the board to say, yes, they are willing to fund capital for 2014 so that we at least know that we should be budgeting and planning accordingly for fiscal year 2014. Obviously, that'll be subject to certain items being eliminated and perhaps even added, but... Versus trying to do a whole year's worth of capital on $82,000, which is impossible. Exactly. Okay. Uh, you know, I, I, think it's, I think it's very important for people and this is not for any of us because we kind of, Jessica walks us through this all the time, but you know, there's, there's, there's this fund out there and it's capital improvement. And that fund was funded by a million dollars in 2007. And over the last five years, six years, it was funded by a transfer from our undesignated reserves. That's important. Right, so, so five years ago, um, this board sat here and said, we're going to take a million dollars and put it into the capital reserve and we're going to fund capital for the next several years. Over the last five years, that fund has been drawn down to buy police cars, ambulances, sidewalk replacement, all the things that we've, we've seen over the, the past five years. And the money that has been revenues over expenses in our regular budget got put into the undesignated reserves. So instead of taking some of that dollars and recoup and replacing it into the capital, it sat in undesignated reserves. And what has happened is now that undesignated, that capital has now been depleted that we can't do any more capital unless we make a change. Yes. Um, which I gotta tell you, we've argued this notion for the last 
two, three years that I've been on the board, and I know what you've argued, Gene has argued it before, that there should be some sort of transfer into capital every year. So we don't run into the point where now four years go by and we don't have any money in our capital. And, and you know, this is what we need to do. Um, so I just think it's very important for people to understand that it was the, the reason that, that things have been done here over the last five years is because of the foresight of a board five years ago that decided to put a million dollars in capital. That's why stuff got purchased. That's why the cars are still on the road. That's why the sidewalks are being replaced. Um, and the responsible thing should have been to continue that, that um, practice. Um, so I'm, I'm done. But So I would be in agreement 100% that we need to fund our capital. So let me just ask this, is there a, with, re, with regard to item two, the actual funding of the capital needs 2014, knowing that of course we're going to be able to look at these items again when we have firmer, firmer numbers, is there a consensus of the board to do that? Yeah, I support that policy, yes. okay. not the amount, but the policy. Okay. okay, so that takes care of number two. So now let's back into number one, which is the kind of the overarching question about how to budget at all. Uh, are we all Oh, we're all clear on the, the, the explanation that Trustee Fran I mean, that, that Director Francis gave us. I, I just demoted you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> also, I just wanted to add, in front of you, I'd left at each place um, budget versus actual to give a perspective of the five years, the history of um, what was budgeted and what actually came to fruition. Um, when there was the potential for utilization of unassigned and or um, fund balance um, commitments that actually never came to fruition because, you, as you will notice, there were surpluses derived in those respective years. So even though the board had allowed utilization of those funds, it, it never occurred because obviously staff, whenever we're making purchases, even if it's for operating or capital expenses, there are certain, certain purchasing protocols that we must follow. And purchases have to come in front of the support. Correct, and anything in excess of $20,000, $20,000 and above. Well, but anything currently at twelve fifty dollars or above must come to Peter and myself for approval and must have um, a requirement with three quotes, unless if it's an exclusive vendor where the, there, there is no other vendor that provides perhaps that item. Well, I, 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 I agree with you. Uh, on the portion of the recreation department because of the fact that the, the, the monies are, there's not that much there. There's, mm -hmm. I, I, I'm, I'm. There are other elements. For example, in, and you don't have it in front of you with this particular packet, but when I handed out the, the fund balance, um, the balance sheet from fiscal year 2012, the final one from the comprehensive annual financial report, it shows various commitments as it relates to, for example, park maintenance, the museum. So if they want to get at that money, basically we're saying we're using current revenue, which technically is not the case because they are actually diving into those funds that are those commitments and the fund balance. So I just want to provide a little bit more perspective as it relates to um, budgeting, essentially. I, I I find it very, very difficult, and I think I've mentioned this before. Um, my household budget isn't anywhere near $8 million. Um, and I find it absolutely impossible. I only have two revenue streams, but I have a lot more expense streams. Um, I would never be able to do zero to zero. I mean, I, I, I can't do zero to zero for, for two months, no less, 12 months. So I, I, you know, I believe that, you know, that latitude is, is needed in order for the, for the, for the, you guys to do your job. I mean, it's just, what you do is you end, you end up under, you know, you end underestimating revenues and overestimating expenses, and that, that ends up being more, more of a fluctuation in, in some ways. What I do with regard to budgeting is I always take a conservative approach. Um, I had mentioned it last year that which happened to a lot of communities where they were scrambling in 2008, 2009, where you weren't getting the state revenues, but you had budgeted to receive them. And even though your CAFR roll reflected that you received them, the cash wasn't coming in. So everyone was saying, cut 10% of your operating budget, figure out where you can make cuts, because 
we don't have the money versus actually planning accordingly, looking at your projections, projecting outward, looking at what your trend is instead of just not necessarily to say that the, the projections were inflated, but if you will, would have looked at trend, you would have realized that things were going downward and you needed to plan accordingly with your budget. And so that's what I do. I plan accordingly. I'm not going to overestimate. If the village ends up having a building, an extra building permit, fantastic. But if we don't get that additional building permit issued, it's not going to hurt us. And that's how I look at it. I would much rather derive a surplus at the end of the fiscal year, which obviously has demonstrated that the village has done versus saying even though we didn't budget to utilize um, unassigned fund balance now we have to and plus you do give the bill you do give the trustees on a monthly basis where Correct. we are based on budget whether we're 10 percent 20 percent 30 percent so Correct. we and even the <laughs> surplus at the end year is less than 5%, so that's pretty darn good budgeting. Right. Yes. I think we have to recognize that. I, I'm in favor of, um, of changing the policy to, to um, reflect Utilism. the balanced budget as expense, yeah, so that we're be able to use the savings and, uh, or the undesignated reserves. Um, and I have a couple of, of reasons for that. One is that um, in the past, when in the past four years, when we haven't required, when we haven't allowed that, uh, well, let me step back and say, if I remember this correctly, 60% of our general fund is personnel, and of that, about 75% is public safety. And if that's accurate, boy, I'm that's pretty amazing. I can remember that. And so when so when we say you have to balance expenditures and revenues, there's very little that can be cut if we don't cut personnel. And we have consistently said that we're not going to cut per personnel. And what's happened over the last four years if the, is that in order to balance that, because costs do go up, we know that, we've been chipping away at maintenance, we've been chipping away at the, at the edges, and we all know that we can only do that for so long, and we've been doing it for four years. So I believe that's one reason for doing it. A second reason for doing it is that we, when we issue a levy, we is issue it on our budget. And so we've been, we've had a surplus that we've said we're going to spend for these things that we haven't been spending money on because we've been forcing staff or we've forced ourselves to, to have current revenues equal current expenditures. And I think we owe it to the village to start spending on these kinds of things that we said we're going to spend on. I think that's just greater transparency. Um, so for those reasons, I think that, that I would support allowing us to start using the money that we've actually put away because we haven't been spending it on ensuring that we have a village that, that meets the standards and, and meets the standards of the residences. Residents. Sorry. I am generally supportive of, of the recommendations here. And as uh, Peter and Jessica and Ben know I've been struggling with how we do budgeting in, in Riverside and trying to educate myself on, on how we proceed. My main struggle is that I don't know how we make any decisions on capital or equipment replacement without knowing where we stand in the long run. I feel like you know every, every vehicle and every piece of equipment we own has to be replaced someday. Yet we are not amortizing that. In other words, we're not looking at, okay, we just bought a, a new car, it costs thirty thousand dollars in seven years, we gotta replace that. Well, our funding goal every year for equipment replacement, vehicle replacement, should have thirty thousand divided by seven years. And we should put that on a on a on a table and say, you know, if we're gonna be on track to be in good shape, we need to set aside $5,000 every year to replace that car. Now, I realize we don't have the kind of money, like, like my household budget, I can't do that at home because I don't have enough extra money to fund a new roof 20 years from now. But we at least need to know where we stand. If we can't fund it, that's one thing. But we at least need to know that we're, we're only funding equipment replacement at a 70% level. And so we're falling behind, or maybe we're catching up, or, you know, and it's gonna fluctuate year to year. Uh, 
likewise, likewise with capital improvements, that's a much dip, more difficult thing because it's not, you, you, it's easy to predict the life of, of cars, relatively easy, of, of cars and copiers and zero turn mowers. But we still should be trying to do that, I think, on capital improvements because I just have, I just have no idea why, you know, we're, we're, we're moving funds every year, but we don't know. Maybe it's going to get worse in five years. Maybe we, how do we prioritize projects without knowing what our future obligations are going to be? And I'd like to see us try to do that at some point. Um, I really think it's important and it will help us make better decisions. And it will help us be honest with ourselves and with the community to say, here's where we stand financially. Yeah, we've got a million dollars in reserves this year, but guess what? Over the next 10 years, we got $2 million worth of equipment and roads we have to replace. And we're doing nothing about that. Uh, so that, that's what I'm struggling with. I would respond to that in that we do actually know projects and we do prioritize them within the CIP. Um, we are, the village board approved a contract to um, uh, uh, complete a street sufficiency study which will help us identify what streets what years um, we're in the process of doing a, a analysis of our sewer infrastructure which will also identify projects and a water analysis which will also in turn do that um, the as far as a vehicle program when when the village has been utilizing a a revenue equals expenditure type of philosophy, it's very difficult to create something where you're amortizing it. It, it was, it, we actually tried that here and it just didn't work because um, what you're doing is you're taking that money away from using it for operations. Well, I, I understand that. I understand that we're not, we may not be able to fund it. Mm -hmm. Uh, we may only be able to fund it at 10% or 20% or whatever, but we still need to know is my but point. But we do, um, in the CIP, the years that the vehicles appear, those are the years that we have identified that, that we as a staff, using information that we gather using, um, in the police case, um, our mechanic, to identify that this vehicle will take us from 1990 to 1995. In 95, we need to plan to replace that vehicle. I think the, you're, you're asking for that one additional step in that if we know that we're only gonna have the vehicle for five years, during those five years, we should be putting aside a certain amount so that in 1995, when it comes due, the money's there to replace it. Or at least we should be knowing how far behind we're falling. And, and, and it may just be a formatting issue that I'm struggling with, and maybe that's it. I mean, I think you're right. I think we just, what I would like to see is, is that one additional step in the CIP and in the equipment replacement plan that shows, you know, yeah, I, I, I don't, you know, we've got like in, in 2015, this vehicle has to be replaced at $30,000. Why don't we see every year how much we should be setting aside with a sum at the bottom so I know how far behind we are or how ahead or whatever. Well, we have a 10-year capital plan. I mean, couldn't we? I know we weren't going to review it for, for the current budget we were going to do this year, I think, only, or 2014. But that's, we have the information. There's a 10-year capital plan. And that's what I'm saying. It may just be, and, and what you just described, Peter, of some of the surveying and some of that, that's, that's great. I didn't know about that. That's exactly where you start. And so it may, that's what I'm saying. It just may be that I, I'm looking to, at, for me to understand it better, that little additional formatting change or additional information. And I, okay, so I think we're getting a little bit off the yeah. topic here. The, the, the question that, that's before us is the definition of the balanced budget. The recommendation is that a balanced budget should be defined as expenditures that do not exceed the revenues and other financing sources. That's the recommendation of staff. I support that. I yes. support that. I, and, and let me just ask you a question. I, you and I discussed one thing when we talked about change. But you said these type of decisions you bring up every year anyways. This is, it's part of the whole process. So this Absolutely. isn't, this isn't like we're making a decision and we're, You're not committing we're, to we're, 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 we're etching all the pillars in, in Riverside with it. No, so it'll, con <laughs> it'll continue to be an issue to consider for the budget process in future years because obviously items will fluctuate and priorities will fluctuate. Okay. You're not giving staff an open checkbook. Okay. 
that's just want to make sure. That's Unless you really want to give me. <laughs> He's already in trouble for calling Donna a revenue stream. Yeah, that's bad yeah. enough. So I just want to make sure we all understand. I just want I just want to understand that. Honey. Thank you. Okay, so your two issues have been answered. Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. My pleasure. And so now the only thing that remaining uh, is to take a look at the at the 2014. And the question really here. Uh, you, you see the current recommendations and the current comments about some, there were some deferrals. Just so staff does not spin its wheels and waste its time, are there, are there any items on, on plan 2014 that, that the board knows that it does not intend to fund for 2014? Trustee Sussman. Okay. Um, I would like to, I would just like to go through the list and, and comment on where I'd like to see changes. Um, I think we should come back. To, uh, Ed's not, Mr. Bailey's not here right now, but I do have some comments about the sidewalk. Um, but I'd like to come back to that. Um, I, Chief Weitzel, I'm not certain that I can support the replacement lockers. I understand that some, Joe, I think I'm going to defer to you on that. On that. But anyway, I'm not certain I can support the lockers. I understand that some of the work in the locker room probably should be done, but I'm not certain about the 35,000. I would support the access control. That was taken up to 2015. I think a very good case was made for the access control, and I, and I would support that. Um, and then the other ones that are deferred, I would agree with. Um, the sidewalk replacement, I would like to suggest, I, the discussion a couple of weeks ago was actually kind of confusing to me because it sounds as if we don't, and I know Ed's not here, it sounds as if we don't have a really specific plan for replacing sidewalks. Um, and an actual cost for the, we, we have an estimate, but not an actual cost. And I would like to suggest um, that we leave the $100,000 in contingent on seeing a more, uh, actually an estimate of the cost and perhaps a plan for how that $100,000 would be used, or knowing that there's a plan. I don't want to go through every um, you know, square in town. I just wasn't certain that we knew exactly what the cost was going to be or what the plan was. Well, I, Following the meeting, Trustee Pollock um, provided staff with a, a good suggestion and lead in, in contacting CMAP for um, possible intern assistance that would help us identify squares and um, throughout the village. So that is one of the things that we are currently looking into already um, to, that would probably lead to what you're, you're asking for, and that is a plan on how to uh, replace sidewalks, where and when. Well, I know this isn't final because we have to vote on it with the budget, but do people want to leave in the 100000 for now? Well, I, I, I agree with you 100% because I, I, we do a street sufficiency study. We just went through all these studies that we do, but we don't have a sidewalk study. I mean, we don't have a, we don't know where, I, I don't know where, we're not ADA compliant, um, today, when I was, when you and I were standing in front of the, uh, the Mrs. Zucksworth, I mean, she, she, sidewalk was up this far. And in the meantime, we're fixing small cracks. Um, you know, I, I, my thought would be we would identify all the problems and rate them from, you know, the most important, which is ADA applications, then our, then the large missing sidewalks, large three inches, then down to two inches, down to one inch. And Doug, you're 100% right. That's that's a great for five, you know, probably for for an intern to, to come and do that. We can have a, a wonderful study done for, for for nothing. And I I personally personally um, I would say I wouldn't I I, I would at, I would go down to fifty thousand at the most because I it, throwing fifty thousand at a at a, at a at a project that we don't have a plan or a policy on, um, I, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't like. Um, but I understand we need to make sure there's money in there to do it once, once we have this plan and policy. So I agree with what you're saying that before the, those those monies can be can be accessed, that we need to have a, a comprehensive sidewalk replacement plan. And, and I do think, Peter, maybe you can speak to this. I think that, that um, Director Bailey does have criteria for how sidewalks are, are repaired. He certainly follows the safe, 
a safe road to school or the safe. Uh, he's just using the um, the routes to school. Routes to um, school. That's how he identifies. So he the, he's made sure, and he can talk about this. I can't really talk yeah. about it. How how he's gone where where most of the walking to school occurs, and and. Um, but they're the ones that can. They're they're the ones that jump and hop and skip. Yeah, and everything. but they're the ones who fall yeah, and break they, they their can, legs too. Yeah. Anyway, I know yeah, we're off topic, I but I, I still would. I'd prefer to leave the hundred thousand in there. I actually agree with what President Sells said. Was if we know that this is, we need to replace these, and we know we're already like, what is it, a hundred years behind or something in our rotation. So do we have a consensus that that we do want this sufficiency study, the sidewalk yes. sufficiency study done? Definitely. Okay. okay. But what about the 100,000 in the CIP? I'd, I'd like to leave it in there That's with a I note mean. in the budget that yes. okay. we're only going to use that for okay, so necessary items until okay. we have Okay. Time. So there's been a recommendation that we remove the replacement lockers? What well, is I, you know, I, I just, I, I, first of all, Chief, um, I would I would support one. You have lockers, but that's also that that's the floor also, correct? Correct. Do you know the dividing between the floors and the lockers? I mean, I, I think at, at very at very minimum, we should get rid of carpeting in a locker room, a because it's I, I think it's gross, and <laughs> b it's also in a basement. I mean, it's in the lower level of the police department. I, I just it's just it's not a good health issue. Um, so I think that should be a solid service. So I, I think that should be addressed. Um, secondly, you, 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 the, the lockers, as I read your memo, and, and I, I appreciate the fact that when you ask for a CIP, I appreciate you defending your CIP. That makes it very easy for us to, to see what we're doing um, and, and to look at stuff. And I, I appreciate that because when you ask for CIP money, I, I, I we have to, you have to defend it to us, but I have to defend it to Richard. You know, um, there's there's and, and the and the public is I, I I have to defend it to the to the residents, and I think it's I think it's I, as much information as I can have is, is, is great. So I appreciate that. Um, but you were talking about this the locking up the the firearms and things like that. Um, I, I, I mean, there's quite a few lockers down there. Um, Correct. There's one for every every male employee outside of the staff. So the detective, anybody that has an office has their own locker. That locker room there is for sergeants and patrolmen, and then the female locker. Is and for it's 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 access control. So you can't. I couldn't just walk down there. No, there's a there's a keypad lock on okay. both doors. So it, so it, it's it's protected. It is. Um, is there? Um, a possibility that we could, is there a section of those lockers that we can replace two or three lockers with cubicle lockable firearm compatible lockers where we don't have to redo the whole unit? I, I think there's a possibility I could buy a separate unit. The locker design that was quoted was a gun locker, smaller gun locker on the top and then a locker that goes to the floor. But I'm sure I could find a manufacturer that that has gun lockers themselves because they have them at the courthouses when you have to lock up your guns to go into court. So I'd have to get a bid for a separate gun locker. My problem would be is space is where it would go. Um, but um, the majority of that 35 or 37 five was the lockers. The flooring was much less yeah, of an issue than the locker itself. But the, the, this manufacturer makes all kinds of lockers, so they, they would give us a quote on a specific gun locker. I just have to see if we'd have to bolt it to the wall or put it into the wall or f find some where for it to be, you know, that, fixed that's, to. That's what I, or, or even if, I, I, again, I, 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 I've been down there once and I, I wanted to get down there again. It seemed like a pretty good sized room. Yeah. It seemed like there's more lockers than personnel. I, 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 that's the way I thought, maybe I'm wrong. Um, I probably am wrong, but I was wondering if any of those lockers are empty that could be removed, and then the gun lockers. There's not. There's, there's one. Not. There's a store. There's a uh, closet for all the communications equipment, radios, flashlights, and then the other locker is the heavy weapons locker, which is has shotguns and and less than lethal, and that's under lock and key that only the supervisors have. So the locking system I'd look for is something just to bolt to the, to the but I can get, I, I can assure you the manufacturers do make just specific gun lockers. 
So if that's a direction the board wants me to look at, I mean, I could, or if, it, if it's just not going unfunded, then we'll just leave it unfunded. But, you know, the manufacturer will do what we ask them to do. So but if you, we ask you them feel for it's gun necessary lockers, from your letter, from a safety standpoint, to have better a better locker system for the firearms at the police department. Yeah, they just lock them in. It just goes into their locker now. Right. It does have a keypad door, but there's no separate gun locker for their weapons. So I would, I would, I personally would like you to explore possibly adding a gun, if we can keep the regular lockers, but if there's room or somehow to add the safety feature that you think is necessary. I can ask a manufacturer, I can get quotes for gun lockers specifically. And if, there, if there's room to put it in, too, yes. that's the other problem. So at this point, you want us to leave, and I know you love this term as a placeholder, do you want to leave the 35,000 in? Because we're going to be able to revisit this when the budget's presented. And at that point, we could have both both the other ideas about lockers, and also we could have a breakout of the flooring if you want to see that. I don't have a problem with that. Is that okay I, with I'd everybody? I'd like to see the flooring break out and, and, and what other locker options okay. we have. Okay. Take. Are there any other items on here that? I, I don't think we decided the access cards, or did we? And I missed that. Does it? Uh, I'm does, suggesting there's a recommendation to put the access back in. I don't. I haven't been sold on that. To be honest with you. I'm sorry, Joe. I was. I haven't been sold on the access cards. Okay. Uh, All right. No. Thirty-seven five. Uh, that was only half, correct? No, that, that, it's, that that's that's total thing. for both the yeah. police yeah, was, and fire. Put in, put in twice. Put in twice. The but it total cost was thirty-seven five. So we have a no. We have a. I, I put it back in. You put it back in. Yes. I know Ellen's. Are we talking about the lockers? No, no we're we're talking about, about the access, access control code. panel. No, no. What did you say? No. No. Okay. So that's three no's. Okay. So it stays deferred at this point. Okay. And I think that's it. Yes? Mm -hmm. So we do have a uh, executive session tonight to discuss the sale of real property owned by the public body. So I'd ask for a motion to adjourn, not to reconvene. No action will be taken in the executive session. Motion. Motion by Mr. Foley. Second. Second by Ms. Collins. Please call the roll. Trustee Sussman. Aye. Trustee Pollock. Aye. Trustee Ballerine. Aye. Trustee Collins. Aye. Trustee Foley. Aye. Meeting is adjourned.